Greetings, my fellow historians. With me is Ashea. And you were just muted for a brief second. <laughs> well then, wiggly, 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 wiggly. Greetings, my fellow historians. I'm Aziz. With me is Ashea, and this is Valar Reredis. Oh, almost with me was one of the cats. He was like on my lap, rubbing on my chin like three seconds. We were so hoping it would be part of the going live, but he's too shy for that, apparently. Valar Reredis is a journey through the books for people who have made the journey before, brought to you by people who have made the journey many times. George R. R. Martin has said it before, and will say it again, that this series was designed to be reread. And we're your tour guides on this journey, but even we, doing this full-time, can't catch everything. So if you're watching live, you can feel free to ask live questions. You can also send questions ahead of time and comments. Doesn't have to be a question, just an observation is certainly cool. You can do that by joining us on one of our social media outlets, Facebook, Flick, Discord, and Slack, and of course, Patreon. You can post questions on Patreon as well and find different ways to support us there. I feel like I hardly have to describe what Patreon is anymore. It's such a big part of the podcast landscape. I just remind y'all that it's there and you know what to do or not. I mentioned at the beginning of our Storm of Swords coverage that our episode documents have been getting larger and larger. And, well, yeah, that's still the case. <laughs> this is the biggest one yet. We had the biggest one yet before, but now this one is 55 pages long. The thing is, uh, we've been making the ep trying to make ep episodes a little bit shorter, but the documents are getting longer. However, one of the biggest reasons for the documents getting longer is our buddy Joe Buckley, who has his co-read podcast called The Isle of Faces, Scraps and Scrolls. And so a lot of these thoughts that Joe is dropping, he's getting into more of a swing of things, I think. He's getting uh, more, uh, just a little more in the habit of this. We've been doing this for, this is our third book now, and uh, it's just getting more habitual, more uh, in the swing of things, you could say. So he's got more to say every time, it seems like, and they're great thoughts, but we can't just keep piling it all in here. So I, again, recommend checking out Isle of Faces and catching these extra thoughts. They're really quite good. This week, we feature... Catlin 2, the gang meets Jane, a.k.a. the one where the phrase storm off. John 2, the gang finds the fist, a.k.a. the one where John loses face. Sansa 2, the one where Sansa outs the Tyrell marriage plot, a.k.a. what you talking about, Willis? Arya 3, the one with the BWB origin story, a.k.a. the gang chases Arya. And Sam won. The gang flees the fist, a.k.a. the one where Sam's a slayer. Yeah, Sam's first chapter. That's pretty exciting. I know a lot of y'all are excited for that in particular. But these other four chapters have a lot going on as well. Today is very much a Stark Ladies and Night's Watch day. Kat, Sansa, and Arya get a chapter along with both John and Sam. The Sansa and Arya chapters are short, but as often is the case, short chapters can pack a punch. And the Catlin one is almost exactly average in terms of chapter lengths. Sam's and John's are on the longer end, though. We can't start an episode during A Storm of Swords without talking about the music theme. Sam's chapter gives us the first version of the Bear and the Maiden Fair that does not lighten the mood, while The Last of the Giants, another song where we get lyrics, is meant to be sad and succeeds at that. Certainly a grit would say so. In Arya's chapter, Tom sings a song about the Kingswood Brotherhood while Sansa thinks of some of their founding members. Hmm. And that leads us to another major theme. The devastation in the Riverlands wrought by Tywin has, and his men has led to a predictable piece of aftermath. Outlaws. Even in the far north, we see the presence of Chet's conspiracy. And in Catelyn's chapter, we get the seeds of the Karstark men turning bandits. So lots of people um, turning against authority here. But a lot of that is based in desperation. And that is where we start with Catelyn's chapter, Catelyn 2, The Gang Meets Jane, a.k.a. the one where the phrase storm off. It's not even the first set of phrase to storm off, but hey, there's a lot of them and news hadn't reached River Run yet. Quote. Rob, she knew, the moment she heard the kennels erupt. So the chapter starts with Grey Wind, though he's not directly mentioned in that sentence. Grey Wind is dangerous and deadly, surely more so than the other wolves given what, by now, must be an exceptional record of battle experience. In fact, Rob gives some accounting of that, and it is this familiarity with killing humans that has given some cause for separation. Quote. 
A hall is no, <clears throat> excuse me. A hall is no place for a wolf. He gets restless, you've seen, growling and snapping. I should never have taken him into battle with me. He's killed too many men to fear them now. Jane's anxious around him, and he terrifies her mother. And there's the heart of it, Catelyn thought. He is part of you, Rob. To fear him is to fear you. I am not a wolf, no matter what they call me. Rob sounded cross. Grey Wind killed a man at the crag, another at Ashmark, and six or seven at Oxcross. That's a lot. That's a lot of kills, yeah. Rob doesn't seem to like all the people saying he's a wolf. It seems to bother him a little bit. Perhaps a bit of wordplay, hearing, uh, calling him Cross, because it's the victor of Oxcross. And yeah, anyway. Point is, he doesn't like it, but it's not that far from the truth. He didn't literally turn himself into a wolf, and some of the stories that are going to come later are even more over the top. But he did see through his wolf's perspective and does with some unknown amount of frequency. We don't obviously don't know how, exactly how much he's warging, but it's probably not on command. Bran's just now learning to do that, and he's been taught and practicing. But maybe Rob could do it on command. But if he could, mm, I suspect it would be less troubling. The randomness of the wolf dreams is part of the mystery and part of the, the problem, really. It's not fun. Well, maybe it is, but not really. <laughs> This could mean he's having serious trouble sleeping with, with this and all the reasons he has to be stressed on top. Well, you can see him being run a little ragged. Jane is spooked by the dire wolf, having seen Grey Wen ki kill people she knows well or knew well. So it's, it's pretty understandable. Nonetheless, it's meant to be ominous, even on first read, that Rob has stated, uh, started staying apart from Grey Wen. And on reread, it's straight up foreshadowing for I the Red say Wedding. Jane's yeah. reaction is very relatable to me because I've seen dogs, like regular sized dogs, like bite their master. Yeah. And, and this it's is turned a huge me off dog. of big dogs completely just seeing that, let alone someone, a, a dog as big as Grey Wind. That you know it's killed people. Someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's freaky. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. It's, it's you can't understate that here. It's a good I would not point. let that, that dire wolf like sleep at the foot of the bed or anything. <laughs> And it's also meant to be tragic that what Kat says about Grey Wind being part of him has further implications. Grey Wind is too used to battle and campaign, but so is Rob. He's forever changed by it as well. I mean, whatever, that's meant to be included here. Anytime Catelyn says something about Grey Wind, well, it applies to Rob and vice versa. Or anytime anyone says anything about Rob or Grey Wind, it goes both ways. They become part of each other. That's the way the warg bond tends to work. Not exclusively, of course. John and Ghost have their separation. Arya and Nymeria have some separation. Bran and Summer, less so, but still. However, it's there. And, of course, it's not just the battle changing Rob in the campaign. It's the warg talent. All of that wrapped together as one. It's a package deal. The Grey Wind is majorly impacted by being a war wolf, and, you know, the, uh, the, the transition goes both ways, or the connection goes both ways. So when Grey Wind is getting frustrated and growling, that's, some of that's coming from Rob. That's not actually the wolf, his own personality shining through. It's kind of a combination. And, of course, we don't know where one begins and the other ends either, so it's not like there's some distinct line we can point to. Even a non-warg pet dog would sense Rob's level of stress. So even without knowing the level to Rob's connection to his wolf, we know it's significant enough. They're both frustrated and scared and out of their natural element and young and separated from their pack. And he's rarely felt that more keenly than, well, than recently because we learn Rob has just learned about Winterfell and Bran and Rickon when, well, when Jane was comforting him. That happened after, right after his injury. So kind of bad luck with the timing there, but what are you going to do? So this, this too, by the way, gave him less faith in the dire wolves. They couldn't save his brothers, and so, well, quote, He frowned. Should I have Grey Wind sniff all my nights? There might be others whose smell he mislikes. So in the document I wrote in all caps with no, with no uh, syntax or, or uh, you know, punctuation, Yes, you should, Rob. And I don't normally do that, so this is how emphatic I feel on that point. <laughs> it serves an example uh, as well for what Rob is passing on to Greywind. <clears throat> the pain he's feeling over his brothers and home 
is passed on to Grey Wind. He feels it too. It's a bit like Shaggy Dog. Think about Shaggy Dog and how he's so wild and out of control and how people think that that's, and I agree with them, that that's Rickon's internal wildness and his you know, frustration at being a young boy and having his family fall apart and not having the capacity to understand it as much as his elder siblings can. Now, moving on to a different problem for Rob, he has a tightrope to walk here politically. He can't really publicly forgive his mother for letting Jamie go, even if he agrees with her logic. But he doesn't even really agree with her logic. He calls it great folly that love is not always wise. Hmm. (laughs) Kat is diplomatic about it, thinking that she doesn't agree, but says, if my heart led me into folly. (laughs) So it's, yeah, it's, it's clever talk there. At this point, she doesn't know about the marriage to Jane. She's about to learn, like, two minutes later. And when she does, she thinks, Mother, have mercy, Rob, what have you done? Speaking of public forgiveness versus private, along with what have you done, Rob, there's what have you done, Edmure. Publicly, they praise him for the Battle of Stone Mill, but in private, they come down hard on him for going far beyond his orders. It's not particularly fair... I think you can criticize Ed Muir and think Rob's orders were unclear. You don't have to take one side or the other. You can blame them both, or you can blame neither. However, no matter how big a mistake you think Ed Muir made, is it a smaller one than Rob's? Probably not. I don't think so. In fact, I polled Twitter, and Twitter thinks definitely not. Y'all voted that Rob's mistake was much larger by a margin of something like 82% to 18%. To be fair, Rob is not not exactly a huge hypocrite here. He's mild towards Rickard Karstark, only gets mad at Edmure when Edmure takes criticism poorly, and of course he's gentle with his mother. It's clear he hadn't thought through Rob's Western campaign much, or very well at all, uh, meaning Edmure, of course. The one who really gets mad is Blackfish, and to be fair to Blackfish, perhaps he got mad about Jane Westerling also, but that's cooled off because that would have been a little while ago, a couple weeks prior. In other words, let's not be fooled by the fact that we don't see Rob's men react to the Westerling situation. Not their initial reactions, except, well, some of the phrase. (laughs) The way Rob's followers treat him remains notable. They love him, despite these mistakes, with a few exceptions, of course. They don't all love him, but generally speaking. It's not unlike Davos going all out to stop Stannis from dishonor. Consider the loyalty inspired by Rob Stark has many of his noble followers offering to marry Frey's to make up for the Westerling insult. Wendell, Wendell Manderley and the Great John's uncles are named, but of course Ed Muir himself is the big offer at the end of the chapter. In the real world, wars are not just won on the battlefield either. This is an important point being shown here gradually in Rob's chapters. Though I don't see a ton in common with Rob Stark and the great Carthaginian general Hannibal of House Barca, they do have this much in common, repeatedly winning battles in enemy territory while slowly losing the war due to politics and internal rivalries and being outclassed in terms of resources. Hannibal had a war elephant, Rob had a dire wolf. Eh, They both had nothing between them and the enemy capital, but not enough men to take it. The Romans and the Lannisters both loved red and gold. Okay, they had a few things in common. Barca, Starca. Okay, I've gone too far. The blame game really overshadows this chapter, and that's a realistic enough thing to happen when things are going wrong. Lots of things are going wrong. It's frustrating to be losing when so much had been going well. They thought they were doing well. So patience is short. Tempers are fraying. Everyone knows it. It kind of builds on itself. It feeds off itself. Karstark in particular is about to hit his breaking point. He's still grieving so much for his sons and, well, put yourself in his place. You won't find yourself justifying the killing of child prisoners, but you will see a man justifiably angry on top of his even more justifiable grief. He's done a great job as a sub-commander to this point. He and his men have been cited for their contributions. His two sons probably saved Rob's life from Jamie, and his other son is a captive. His sons died before Rob became king, and wanting more Lannister blood was part of why he was among the first to yell for the new kingdom. 
Now his king has broken his sworn word and the king's mother has released their extraordinarily valuable prisoner on a pretense that could easily be judged as thin. Now, it doesn't matter necessarily what you think about Catelyn letting Jamie go, whether you think it's going to work. Someone like Rickard Karstark is going to look at the downside of this pretty severely, as well as the honor side. It's just so outlandish, even if it actually seems, if you think about it, actually, maybe this would work. It's not going to come off well to someone like Karstark. And even if you think it could work, you have to admit that it could easily backfire. Outlaws almost did cause it to backfire. Ambushes by outlaws or someone else. Or Tywin just being like, no, we're not letting Sansa go. It's that simple. So there's lots of ways this plan could go wrong, you got to admit. But again, Rob is keeping it together pretty well. He's calm in person. He's, you know, his demeanor is, uh, I think, commendable. However, a lot of that has to do with his, you know, being young and having a new love here. He's a teenager having his first sustained sexual relationship, after all. That probably helps with his stress level a little bit. That said, like so many other things that start off well for Rob, it's just not going to work out. The benefits, uh, well, they're going to be kind of short term. He's got so much else to deal with, and the, the, the new love aspect of this is going to wear off pretty fast in the face of so many big issues. The Karstark betrayal is about to happen. Then he's showing his own signs of despair, but also determination. And that determination comes in large part from his upbringing, not just his father, who he learned more from in a direct sense when it comes to being a lord and military leader, but from his mother, he learned quite a bit about things like this. Now, I know a lot of you picture show Rob in general. It's hard not to. I mean, let's remind ourselves that book Rob is not sleek and slender and dark-haired like Prince Charming, and I'm not using that as a metaphor. Richard Madden was literally cast as Prince Charming, so I'm not even joking. (laughs) Book Rob is a big blue-eyed teenager with long red hair. I mean, he's got a big chest. He doesn't really look like Richard Madden. Not that Richard Madden was a bad Rob Stark. I thought he was very good, but he did not look like Book Rob at all. So I've pointed this out before, but When you picture him as Book Rob, it makes it maybe a little easier to remember that he's so Tully and that his mother's influence is very strong. And it's shown more directly. Cat and Rob have a ton of conversations where Catelyn's influence is huge. Rob's influence from Ned, there's never a one-on-one there. It's more implied. It's like, well, Rob, this was all off page before the book started. Now, especially, though, the thing John is resisting in his next chapter, John 2, which is next up for us. He doesn't want to hook up with a grit because he doesn't want to father bastards. Rob, for his part, got this lesson wrong from his father because Ned lied about why John was around and who John's parents were. It's understandable. We've been over why. We don't need to rehash that. But this is a tragic, indirect effect of it all. Something that Ned couldn't have seen this coming. No one could have seen this coming, really, I don't think. And sadly, Rob's impression on the whole situation about bastards and fathering them, he got a pretty negative impression from his mother as well. Catelyn's issues with John surely have shaped how Rob sees bastards. So not only does Rob, not only does, rather, does Westeros treat bastards poorly in general, Rob got a negative example from his mother and a cover-up from his father. So his upbringing was really good in so many ways, but this is not an example of that and of course if we're wrapping it all up Catelyn's negative example is in part because of the cover-up but we could go on all day like this (laughs) that but that's the nature of influence though right you can't pin it down exactly you can't put numbers on it. you can't quantify it yet we know it's extremely certain children learn from their parents one way or another even the absence of them and uh, though that's not the case here Rob didn't have Uh, That to deal with, his parents were very active in his life, but mm, there's a few negative side effects to that. These are the kinds of things that remain subtle and easy enough to miss, even on multiple rereads, right? This The way the influence of his parents and all these subtexts, this is sometimes hard to pick up on. But some other things that you might have missed on first read now stick out like red flags. Red, very fitting to call them red flags, because isn't it amazing the sheer amount of 
red wedding foreshadowing there is, not just in this chapter, but just all around these chapters. It's just all over the place. In this chapter, it's it's more of a strategic reckoning, like the inevitability of it all. If you sit down and look at the way the war is going, it, it doesn't necessarily lead to the Red Wedding, but it leads to bad things for Rob and, and his people. Uh, in other chapters, there's straight up supernatural prophesying. So it's, it's not just there's literary foreshadowing, there's historical foreshadowing, there's kind of seeing the writing on the wall kind of foreshadowing. What kind of, what category do you put that in when it's the dire wolves, though? Hmm, this is interesting, right? Quote. He bares his teeth every time Sir Rolf comes near him. A chill went through her. Send Sir Rolf away. At once. I mean, yeah, that's, this is true. Like, whether this is a, a wolf, a dog wolf type situation where they can just sense ill intent, because that, that can happen in the real world, or whether this is something more supernatural. Sir Rolf is one of the traitors. He's one of the ones in on the Red Wedding plan. So, yeah, you don't want to... <laughs> you do not... Uh, you, you, Catelyn's right about that. It's interesting. Catelyn does put a lot of stock into the dire wolves' reactions, despite, you know, yeah. being a, a southerner. It's uh, Ever since Summer uh, saved yeah. Bran, she's just been sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be too. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, that's that's proof positive right there. So... And again, it's interesting that you point that out, too, because we noticed this at the beginning of the series when we were very wary for foe shadowing. We noticed that Catelyn often makes uh, isn't a great judge of character, but she's really good at judging the supernatural, which is kind of backwards. <laughs> almost like when she has a feeling about something supernatural, she's almost always right. Her her like I said, with character, I, I'm, I probably a little harsh there. Her judgment of people is mixed. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's bad, like Littlefinger, bad, and um, a couple other examples that I'm just spacing out on here, but another one's that she's been really good about. But in this case, she knows it's, it's a combination of both. She's like, okay, don't trust that person because the dire wolf doesn't. So those things are kind of coming together here. We also get Sybil Spicer, who's more blatantly involved in the Red Wedding, more, more of a uh, notorious culprit, so to speak. We really get a quick look at her. Um, I wish that uh, Grey Wind had given us a reaction to her, maybe, but maybe that was too obvious. Um, maybe her react, him reacting to two characters or three characters would have been too much. But I kind of wish Grey Wind had just, you know, kind of gone for her. <laughs> you know, been like, oh. <laughs> All right. A uh, couple of thoughts um, from Joe. It had been raining for days now, a cold gray downpour that well suited Catelyn's mood. Her father was growing weaker and more delirious with every passing day, waking only to mutter Tansy and beg forgiveness. Edmure shunned her, and Sir Desmond Grell still denied her freedom of the castle. So that's a quote, of course. The slide Catelyn is now on is far from a super fun, happy one, and to drive the point home, George makes all the surroundings and weather influence the mood and atmosphere. It's really, yeah, it's, it's gray and, and rainy constantly, and it's going to be that way for a while, and, and of course you're going to notice that in Arya's chapter... But that, of course, is because she's not that far away. So being within the same weather system is, uh, well, that's how it should work, basically. Now, a little more about Rolf Spicer. He obviously is planning to receive rewards later on. This is probably what, to get rewarded for the Red Wedding, that's what I mean by him being in on it. He's already, you know, planning on getting something from the Lannisters and Freys. And Joe wants to know, too, if this is detecting intentions or just concrete future acts it's kind of the same similar question but with a little more nuance to it whether uh it's supernatural or whether he's just smelling that's what wolves and dog can do they can smell chemicals that are coming from your brain that indicate what emotion you're feeling at the time uh, something that humans cannot do not even close uh, Joe also cites this line, You have robbed me of my vengeance. Catelyn faced him calmly. Lord Rickard, the Kingslayer's dying would not have bought life for your children. His living may buy life for mine. Uh, uh, he, Joe says he absolutely loves his Catelyn moment. A large, scraggy Northman is being quite aggressive here. And not only does Catelyn not back down from him, she also refuses to try and placate him. She tells him, in the simplest terms, her logic behind her actions. And even if he doesn't agree, that's fine. He's, she's not going to be, you know, berated. At the t as the text states, Rickard is unappeased. And yeah, what could have satisfied him, though? He's angry. He's, as we've gone over, he's got so many reasons to be upset. And this is a new, a fresh insult on top of everything. Now, this is an interesting point because 
there's a lot of talk about Catelyn in the fandom. Catelyn is often held under a microscope as, as uh, and for good reasons, a lot of times be looking her as a, an example of motherhood and, but also as an example of what George does with the mad woman trope, uh, the grieving mother trope, which is George inverts it for sure. He does not lean into it. He doesn't, you know, kind of rehash something we've all seen a million times. He does different things with it, but I'm not trying to get into that right now. I'm trying to talk about how much Rickard Karstark is the opposite of that. The parallel, well, not the opposite, the parallel to that of the, uh, of the other gender or the male gender rather. He's, very much the angry, vindictive, grieving, mad father. Uh, he's going to go commit murder because of it. And I think this is one of the ways George plays with that trope is he shows that it happens to men too. It's just maybe they react a little, maybe their grief takes slightly different forms. Maybe it's a little more bloody. Maybe it's a little more likely to have sword in hand, but it's just as dangerous or it's dangerous in its own way. And it's just as worthy of examination. And it's just as real uh, because grief and, and vindictiveness, those are very human emotions that certainly aren't the province of fantasy novels only. And meanwhile, Lady Mormont takes her hand and says, my lady, if Cersei Lannister held two of my daughters, I would have done the same. So it's really interesting too to get both sides of the argument this way and to say that this is not some clear-cut case there there was no right answer here and there's not necessarily a wrong answer here damned if you do damned if you don't and uh yeah i think some nuance is, is called for here now also what i want to point to is just how much this breaks down on gender lines almost all the people and how personal it is for them almost all the guys that are lords under rob Many of them are fathers themselves, and a lot of them have sons Rob's age. They want their sons to be like Rob, but fear ending up like Rickard Karstark. Meanwhile, there's a lot fewer women, uh, but Mage Mormont and uh, the others kind of give us that, uh, at least give us that side of it. We've got a few takes from Nina. We've had Nina add directly to our documents these days. She's got regular great takes, uh, great takes on the regular, I should say. And I, I've been using them regularly, so why not make it a little more official? So in this case, she points out that Rob might have seen the consequences of his skin changing in a way that Arya on Bran can't or don't. We've spent a lot of time talking about the differences in the warg experience, and this is a really big one, because while Nymeria has done some killing... It's really indirect. Arya isn't in control of that. She doesn't see it personally. And she certainly isn't connected in a positive way to the people that are being killed, which is very different for Rob. Rob not only is seeing soldiers killed in front of him, he may be seeing it afterwards in his dreams or maybe even during it if Grey Wind is sort of in an advance party or something like that. And that he may be having dreams or, or remembrances of... Grey Wind killing people that Jane knew all her life. That's just a very different thing. Like, Ghost hasn't killed anyone that John wants to be friends with, even though he's hanging out with the Wildlings. And certainly that doesn't happen for Arya either. There's nothing like this for them. So this is a very unique thing, and it's another reason why people really wonder what a Rob Stark POV would have looked like. Nina's always on top of house words. And she says the Westerling words are honor, not honors, which she says is very ironic. And I'd have to agree because Sybil has already negotiated for honors. In other words, pardons, marriages, and all that thing. And a castle for Rolf uh, all behind the scenes here. So, <laughs> and he did, she does this by tricking Rob into thinking he's compromised his, her daughter's honor. And by thus, you know, that leading to him having to marry her to satisfy the, the demands of honor, which, you know, they're actually looking for honors, not honor. <laughs> so they, she is living up to their house words exactly backwards. And some thoughts from y'all. Ainsley Michael John Griffiths with a super chat, a pear, apple, and a cup of coffee. Well, I thanks for the cup of coffee. I have, some of you may have noticed, I, I've mentioned it a while back, I don't drink coffee during the stream that much anymore. The adrenaline of being live and talking to y'all is enough for me. I, I was overdoing it, and it's, I think it's helped a lot. Of, I'm a little more, a little more relaxed, Can which I is say saying something? something. Yeah. Actually, it's Xerxes who wants to say something. Oh, does he? 
There, there you go. He's just purring really loud. <laughs> so I wanted to give you all a, just a little second of purr. Yes, let that cat purr. Take a little of your stress away. Abraham Gabayu says the image of Rob's armor rusting in his cloak being stained with mud and blood is quite ominous, like all his protection is slipping away gradually. That's a good point, and I think it's meant to also... There's a lot about Rob's appearance that we could say there. I just talked about, I focus mostly on just the fact that he looks like a Tully and not a Stark. But this is a good point, and I think it touches on as well the direwolf in him and how somehow, and, and vice versa, how he's bloody and ragged and bedraggled and stressed out like crazy. And uh, some of that is coming from his wolf. And uh, I, that's, a, that's a great point to, to extend this notion to his clothing and uh, how that r- symbolizes what's going on internally. Ed Muir is seen listening to Rhyme in the Rhymer which seems to prove Lem's retort to Tom O'Sevens is accurate. So this is actually a quote from Aria 4. We're doing Aria 3 today, but these two dots are connected, so I just have to drop this for y'all. A man who hates music can't be trusted, I always say. It's not music he hates, said Lem. It's you, fool. So that seems to prove it. So Edmure is listening to music, but he doesn't like the Floppy Fish song, so yep. <laughs> Now, Tywin expresses a sentiment similar to what Edmure expresses during the argument about why Rob was in the West. Uh, in this case, Tywin's probably using it as propaganda, whereas Edmure is just clueless. Anyway, here are the quotes. You think we stayed for plunder? Rob was incredulous. Uncle, I wanted Lord Tywin to come West. Now compare that to this line from Tyrion Three, which we'll have next week. What do we know of Stark's plans and movements? Asked Mathis Rowan, ever blunt and to the point. He has run back to River Run with his plunder, abandoning the castles he took in the West. So Tywin's maybe downplaying the West, what happened in the West, and maybe that's kind of saying that that's why we didn't bother to go get him, you know, because some of the some of the people in the room don't know the way the campaign actually played out. He's like, yeah, we didn't want to go fight him, we didn't need to. <laughs> he was just after plunder. We didn't care. So it's it, downplaying the strategy and downplaying the fact that Tywin almost got trapped and Tywin was going to fall for this trick if not for uh, Ed Muir kind of accidentally goofing it. Small note here, Elena, E-L-E-Y-N-A, is is, is spelled Elenia here, but Elena everywhere else in the, in the series. So probably just a little typo, but most of you probably didn't even notice that. But hey, want to point that out? Stephanie the Peerless draws a nice comparison here to locking up Grey Wind is familiar to Danny fans or just to Danny's arc when she eventually locks up the dragons under the pyramid. Uh, of course, eventually they get out, but that's later. And um, yeah, that's very interesting because she feels really bad locking them up and it's not, uh, there's not as much a supernatural connection between them. The bond isn't as strong, but it's still, she's a, she feels like their mother and locking them up is painful for her. And uh, Grey Wind, is, it's, it's kind of the opposite for, for Rob. He's moving away from this. And I think part of that is because it's tormenting him a bit. I think the dreams, maybe he wants to be a little separate from that. And he doesn't like being called a wolf. So there's a lot going on here. But I don't think Danny minds being called a dragon. <laughs> she, she leans into that. It's also more true for her. <laughs> Actual dragon blood. Paul Barry uh, from Patreon brings up the the discussion of the wolves and where they came from. He's a little wondering back to the makeup of the litter, wondering how could there have been exactly six dire wolves to f- line up with the Stark kids. He, bl- he he believes that Blood Raven could have led the mother dire wolf to where she needed to be, but how could he have possibly influenced the number of pups? Probably not influence the number of pups, but maybe. I mean, Green seers are awfully powerful. If you can find a pregnant dire wolf and do some magic and manipulate that, I don't know. I feel like there is some chance they could cause that kind of manipulation. It's kind of weird to think about. But Maybe there's just, you know, a few dire wolves that are pregnant, and he picked the one that happened to have sex. Oh, yeah. He can see how many, li- he could sense how many different lives are growing within them and pick the one that had six. Yeah, that makes sense. Out know. of enough pregnant dire wolves, there'd be one that had exactly six. Yeah, you know, and it was early enough that he sends her on down. Okay. Good good point. Yeah, that's a good way to explain it that is that is less supernatural than actually then, changing the number of babies. <laughs> I'll split that embryo one more time. <laughs> 
Alberto Gomez sends a super chat, the 100 emoji. Thank you very much, Alberto. Tree Girl reminds us of a theory somewhat parallel to the notion that Sybil was dosing her daughter to keep her from getting pregnant, which we know happens. That maybe she also gave Rob some kind of love potion to make him fall for Jane. Now, if that sounds crazy, well, it shouldn't sound too crazy. There's talk of love potions elsewhere in A Song of Ice and Fire. For example, in the Dunkin' Egg novellas, it gets mentioned. There's not any evidence that they work, but there isn't evidence there isn't proof that they don't work either uh now of course you need to prove that they do work for me to believe them but i i'm amenable to the possibility especially since let's not forget who we're dealing with here sybil spicer's mother or grandmother i I forget it was maggie the frog who it knows all about magic and potions and elixirs and stuff so the idea that maggie the frog could have some kind of love potion i'm not going to just accept that but i could totally believe it if george drop that knowledge i'd be like yep well we were kind of on that point we we thought that might be possible so onward to a chapter where a starkling is right to give in to the temptation to sleep with someone (laughs) john 2 the gang finds the fist aka the one where john loses face now of course i'm repeating the same joke of Tyrion losing face back during the battle of the blackwater In this chapter, they reach the fist and see the slaughter done there. So I want to ask you all, live chatters and just you all listening afterwards, did you think Sam was dead when you read the book the first time? Think about that and answer it while we work through the rest of the chapter. John, in this chapter, gets deeper into wildling culture, especially a grit. (laughs) Hey-o. Big enough for you? Yeah. There it is. Big yeah. enough for you. If you were to hear that line out of context, but knew it was said by Tormund, who was on my shirt today, well, you wouldn't think he was talking about giants riding mammoths. But that surely is quite a sight. I joke in part because this bit is actually quite sad, and I'm trying to lighten the mood a little bit. The plight of the giants is highlighted here, though John sees so many and thinks, wow, that's a lot. It's not really a lot from the perspective of a species total population. It's quite little, in fact. Grit calls him out on that, and it's a good example of him knowing nothing, which is really the perfect thing to say to someone that thinks they have it figured out, but clearly doesn't. Quote. The giant swayed slowly atop the mammoths as they rode past two by two. John's Garin shied, frightened by such strangeness. But whether it was the mammoths or their riders that scared him, it was hard to say. Even Ghost backed off a step, baring his teeth in a silent snarl. The direwolf was big, but the mammoths were a deal bigger, and there were many and more of them. John took the horse in hand and held him still, so he could count the giants emerging from the blowing snow and pale mists that swirled along the milk water. He was well beyond 50 when Tormund said something, and he lost the count. There must be hundreds. No matter how many went past, they just seemed to keep coming. And most of them are still out there, y'all. This is really interesting. A lot of them showed up at the Battle for the Wall. Some of them were killed by Stannis' army, but most of them just went back north. And that's not good because they can't defeat the others, so they may come back south again dead. And in fact, we do see a dead giant in Sam's chapter. Sam notes that, or rather, John notes they can reach up to 14 feet tall. They aren't much like what Old Nan described, which is this. In Old Nan's stories, giants were outsized men who lived in colossal castles, fought with huge swords, and walked about in boots a boy could hide in. Yeah, that's not at all accurate. These are like huge, hairy things. They don't look like men much at all. He sees that they look more like the mammoths they're riding than people. They look like a cross between a mammoth and a person. Maester Lewin would have probably been closer to the truth with his lessons about their physicality, minus the very notable exception of thinking they're extinct. The Citadel badly misusing the principle of, we haven't heard about it in a while, so it must be gone. They believe giants are extinct because it's been over a century since the last report of one. But here's several reports right here, y'all. Now, there's that Lord Alaric Stark seen in Fire and Blood, acting all like Stannis before there was a Stannis, with Queen Alysanne. 
he became Lord after his elder brother died beyond the wall to giants. That's right. Lord Walton Stark was killed by giants in the era of the Iron Throne. But it was more than 100 years ago. More than 200, in fact. Close to 250. So, yeah, they were just laying low, which is kind of a weird thing for giants to do. But, hey, the (laughs) the land beyond the wall is vast. Don't forget. So the Citadel is going to have to update those beliefs. There's going to be giants at the wall soon, including a helpful one named One One. Which, by the way, I can't. One One, he's just Brand the Builder's workforce. Come again, isn't he? Well, we're a ways away from that, though. It's not only giants riding mammoths. There's Was also that's a sh- real secret. You know how there's like ancient aliens, like <laughs> ancient giants. <laughs> the real story. The, the real story of how the pyramids were built. The wall. The wall. <laughs> And the wall, right, right, the wall. <laughs> it's not only giants riding mammoths, they're sharks riding mammoths. No, just kidding. But that would be cool. There are free folk riding mammoths, though. I guess that's cool, too. There's, like, those big, like, ten guys at a time riding a mammoth. Yeah, that is pretty cool. One of the reasons this Storm of Swords is my favorite of the books is that it seems to highlight the song aspect of a song of Ice and Fire so much. All the books have songs, but this is the one that seems to have the most lyrics the actually written out where the characters engage with the songs directly they're in, in in other words these songs become individual topics by themselves let alone as a group you can you can do a whole topic about the songs people have done that in fact in this case we get a moving rendition of the last of the giants the lyrics speak of the giants ruling the world when it was born And there are many records and stories in the world of ice and fire and elsewhere that reveal that there's a decent amount of evidence supporting this claim. The children certainly tell Bran the giants are as old as they are, so uh, I believe it. Here's where the sadness of the end of the giants gets worse, though, because it's a projection of the same truth for the free folk. As Melisandre says in one of her predictions, I think it might be correct, too, the free folk are a doomed people. We might even see it in the books. More likely it will take time. There'll be some remnants of them left, but it, it, they might be somewhat wiped out as a, as a nation. But, the, I mean, it's a very different thing still, obviously, the free folk to the giants. That's the free folk being assimilated, you know, yeah. into another human culture. Humans aren't dying. This is you're right. giants dying. You're right. It's, it's the, you're right. That's a, that is a very important distinction that's to be made. That's a species dying off versus, you know, a nation, which that's obviously tragic and terrible, but yeah. a, a fair bit different. That's a good point. Yeah, way of life versus actual extinction. Yes. Good, yeah, good point, good point. <clears throat> uh, so the way their way of life is not sustainable in such times, meaning the horrors of winter being extremely greater than they've ever been before, as tough as they are. This is something that they've not faced in thousands of years. Um, and that'll wipe out so many of them. And then the, you know, trying to assimilate in the South, that'll cause more losses, conflict, or people just giving up their old ways. Maybe it'll be very, even more on the nose with the Giants, where it'll just be a few hundred free folk surviving after the end of the books. Now, that would line up better with what the TV gave us. If we think ahead... Though there's reasons to suspect what the TV show gave us for the ending of the Wildlings might not be accurate for the books. Uh, There's no wall at the end of the show. Well, there's a wall, but it's broken. The seasons might be fixed. That's unclear in the show, but in the books that I think we'll get a better explanation. So it's going to be a different world altogether. The survival of the fittest culture that endorses Raider as a valid profession and kidnapping as a valid wedding That's just going to be hard to keep that way of life going when both cultures are going to have more concert and connection with each other because there's not going to be the wall separating them anymore and there's not going to be this great common enemy. So that last bit about raiding and kidnapping, though, that's very much what John himself thinks. We got to we got to deal with that with more nuance. He has thoughts that no doubt many, if not most of us readers have had, too, which is that a lot of these free folk are charismatic and some of them are interesting so even though he's very very turned off by a lot of their cultural beliefs he likes a lot of them anyway i mean he's fond of torment he likes long spear rick and of course Igrit saying he likes her is is selling it short john would never adapt to raiding and kidnapping etc but the free folk attitude towards love and music and le- leaving one war band for another whenever you feel like it or 
warriors being warriors no matter their gender. These are the kind of things that John can be like, yeah, this is smart. I like I mean, this also part of their just culture. Freedom, birthright, not mattering. You know, yeah, the list is yourself. long. Yeah, you're right. Those are those are very good points. I did. I should. I could have made a longer list, but it's 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 easy to see. Basically, like just reach into the bag of wildling culture, and you're likely to pull out something that you like. There's plenty of things that you won't like, but that's the point here. That the wildlings are not a backwards people. They are maybe in some ways technologically backwards, sure, but some of these things are pretty progressive or intelligent or at least wise. So it's a conundrum. The free folk have the, some of these awful things and some of these respectable things, things that might, like I said, you might even call some of these things enlightened. This chapter gives us more in a lot of these characters, and they argue kind of, they show us some of these good things. While John is the fish out of water who is so confused by all this and doesn't is, is out of sorts because he doesn't agree with some of these cultural traditions, but also he's finding things he likes. So here's a couple other characters. Uh, Harma Dogshead, Steer, the Weeper, Rattleshirt. We get a little more on him. We've seen him already, obviously, but more on him. Tormund's kids, Dormund and Toreg and Munda. I love those names so much. Dormund, Toreg, and Munda. <laughs> but also, it's it's easy to forget with the show and all that Tormund's a fair bit older and has yeah. kids. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> There's also Jarl and Varamir Sixskins. And you of wrote course, six kings. Six I wrote kings. six kings in the yeah, document. Six kings, no six <laughs> kings. Yeah. And of course, Orel. How could uh, and and how could we know Melisandre of all people would be showing up at the end of the book to set him on fire from afar? <laughs> Poor Eagle. Nah, I don't feel too bad for him, really. But still, it's 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 a, it's quite a twist. Nor could we know the other supernatural twist present in this subplot that wasn't really Orel and the Eagle anymore when Melisandre burns him. We thought it was still Orel, but we find out later. Much later, <clears throat> that it was Varamir Sixkins, who's a much more powerful skin changer, who took over the eagle. Orel remains. Like, there's aspects of his personality, but they're buried, and they're not in control anymore. He, Orel, uh, his feelings are transmitted to Varamir, but not his commands, not his directives. So maybe it's a little bit like how Hodor's personality takes a backseat to Bran's when Bran's skin changes into him. But this is more permanent. Perhaps this is a bit like the ending of being John Malkovich. Spoilers. <laughs> that movie's rather old. If you haven't seen it by now, then I'm sorry. But if you have, you know what I'm talking about. One of the most informative tools at our disposal during a thorough reread is that we get to take special note of chapters seen from multiple perspectives. I really enjoy doing this. It's super fun. If, I'm not, if it's not clear what I mean, never fear. I will continue to explain. This happens a little in early Game of Thrones when so many POVs are in the same place. You see kind of see things from both sides. But that's not what I mean. I mean when the second perspective is revealed much later. I mean like you didn't know that the other person was there. For example, when we find out way later that Barristan was in the crowd when Ned was executed at the end of a Game of Thrones. That reveal comes much later. Mance isn't quite the same since we don't get inside his head with a point of view, but it's a close concept because he was at the feast during John's first Game of Thrones chapter when Robert and Cersei and everybody was there. So, since we're getting John's first thoughts on Varamir, why not look ahead to when Varamir thinks about meeting John in the A Dance with Dragons prologue? When he claimed the eagle that had been Orel's, he could feel the other skin changer raging at his presence. Orel had been slain by the turncloak crow, Jon Snow, and his hate for his killer had been so strong that Varamir found himself hating the beastling boy as well. He had known what Snow was the moment he saw that great white direwolf stalking, silent at his side. One skin changer can always sense another. Mance should have let me take the direwolf. There would be a second life worthy of a king... He could have done it, he did not doubt. The gift was strong in snow, but the youth was untaught, still fighting his nature when he should have gloried in it. <laughs> so everyone, much has been made of John having a second life inside Ghost, so second like life a worthy king. of a yeah. king. <laughs> see, Varamir six kings, see? I was on the right track. <laughs> so that adds a lot more to this scene, I think. We see also not only that, but we see how truly in charge Mance is his authority is is pretty absolute even though it's it's not 
what the wildlings are used to following in terms of command structure, but it's there when they when someone earns it. Like Mance has. We're also given tribes and clans without named individuals, you know, some of these kind of out there peoples, uh, some of whom could become interesting during the Winds of Winter, perhaps. John notes how some of them are not only very strange by Seven Kingdom standards, but that they are as removed from some of these other clans as John is to them. He realizes that many of these clans have never seen the wall. It's like, yeah, the North is big. <laughs> This is not much different than most peasants who never go much farther than the village they were born. And that's a common refrain hearing about peasants never going more than a mile from the place they were born. So you could see why that wouldn't be so, so different for wild and clans living really, really far north of the wall. So here's the description of some of these folk. And there were folks fiercer even than Veramir from the northernmost reaches of the haunted forest, the hidden valleys of the frost fangs and even queerer places. The men of the frozen shore who rode in chariots made of walrus bones, pulled along by packs of savage dogs, the terrible ice river clans who were said to feast on human flesh, the cave dwellers with their faces dyed blue and purple and green. With his own eyes, John had beheld the hornfoot men trotting along in column on bare soles as hard as boiled leather. How the heck did they... Do that. <laughs> I want to know where'd they get the dyes. Ah, good question. There's there's trading that goes up. Maybe they yeah, make it. There may be some just... some plants they can. Yeah. There may be some version of woad. You know, <laughs> <laughs> blue dye. Yeah, it's neat. Uh, it's super cool. Like I I'm I'm curious to hope uh, that we learn more about these guys or at least some of them. So giants are strange to John, right? But to a lot of these folk, John was raised amongst things dozens of which seem normal to him, but would seem unbelievable to them. And But not giants, not wargs, not direwolves. These things are normal to them. But yeah, Winterfell would blow their mind. Um, you know, a column of armored knights would blow their mind. A dragon, well, that's going to blow everyone's minds, when <laughs> wildling or not. Though ordered to do everything he can to make his joining of the free folk look sincere, John really struggles with the egret part. Well, at first. This is because it's not just about duty. He can break his oaths in the name of his mission easier than he can forget his personal trauma over fathering children out of wedlock. He has a lot of ra he has a lot wrapped up in his head about that. He does not want to do as his parents did, even though free folk culture has absolutely no problem with it. It's not easy for him to just when in Rome, you know, f 15 years of trauma. After all, Mance himself is the child of a brother of the Watch and a woman of the free folk himself. They're, the king they're all following is proof that in this culture you can rise literally to the top and your birth has nothing to do with it. And of course, Mance and Mance's parents weren't married. <laughs> Mance had plenty to overcome to become king. It was not easy for him to become king. But social stigma over his parentage, that was not it. That was not the problem. So the right of free association and placing value on love is another major cultural difference. I suppose a free folk philosopher could argue that kidnapping a bride isn't really that much different than an arranged marriage. I actually polled Twitter about that. The results in a minute. The woman has no choice in either of these cases. Though a free folk woman can kill her husband for being brutal to her and no one will throw her in prison for it. So there's, at least there's a way out, sort of a way out. It's huge to me that Mance, but not just Mance, gave a surprising amount of deference to John when here and regret when hearing that they are together. A sheepskin cloak. Oh, god damn it! <laughs> a sheepskin cloak. I don't know what I was trying to say there. Sorry, said he grit. And there's many a night we dance beneath it too. Jarl laughed, and even harm a dog's head smirked. Is that the way of it, Jon Snow? Asked Mance Raider mildly. Her and you? It was easy to lose your way beyond the wall. John did not know that he could tell honor from shame anymore, or right from wrong. Father, forgive me. Yes, he said. Mance nodded. Good. You'll go with Jarl and Steer on the morrow then, both of you. Far be it from me to separate two hearts that beat as one. That is a big deal. Just the fact that they're together, it's like it stops everyone in their tracks. He, like, Jarl and, and Harma, they were like mocking John. Like, Harma did not like John. Well, you know, you kind of get why Harma doesn't like John. Not only is he a crow come over, but Harma doesn't like dogs. So 
she probably doesn't like wolves. But just hearing that they're together, it just like changes the mood dramatically. Like you in the Seven Kingdoms, people would be like, they would shrug. They'd be like, okay, y'all are together. Who gives a who gives a crap? <laughs> Follow orders. <laughs> but here, this is this is some serious deference. Um, and and Grit, especially, she thinks of it uh, as super meaningful. Of course, John is still shamed by it. And well, there's so many of these undertones of common bond between the Wall and the Seven Kingdoms, beyond the Wall rather, and the Seven Kingdoms. This is a contrast to that. It's a major divide, at least for John. Hmm. But being torn between two worlds for John, that is something that he needs to get used to and us readers should be used to he's going to have a few things that tor- tear him multiple directions when it comes down to being offered Winterfell whenever his parentage emerges whenever Daenerys comes around there's going to be lots of him torn between two worlds this is just the start of that and arguably he's been living that his whole life um, as a member of the Starks you know with Catelyn not being a big fan of his just you know all that it, it, these are all similar kind of things a minor recurring theme, speaking of being torn between two worlds in a different sense, John thinking about Ghost being off hunting, but not actually seeing it in his dreams. A lot of the other, you know, well, not a lot of the other, but both Bran and, and Arya are, have wolf dreams where they see their wolf hunting. We don't actually see that with John. It's a good example of us having so much to see in A Song of Ice and Fire that we don't always notice what's missing. Quite often, the absence of something can matter as much as any tangible detail, however. So, in our quest to get as much understanding as possible with regards to skin changing, especially the Starks and the Direwolves, let's think back. John had that one mega dream back in John 7, The Clash of Kings. But since then, we do know he goes into Ghosts later. In A Dance with Dragons, he sees Shaggy Dog on Skagos and Nymeria in the Riverlands, and this appears to be his choice. He's, in, you know... M- controlling this dream somewhat in that dream he can sense summer but doesn't know where summer is but we know he's beyond the wall as it turns out so here comes the theory that the wall blocks some of this power it but it so it can explain a lot of the loss of sense of summer and when john is separated from ghost and can't see him hunting things like that it can explain some of it but not all of it so it seems to be a reason but maybe not the only reason. Uh, we'll, we'll say it's a factor. John will later note he had lost his sense of ghost for a time, which seems to correlate with them being on opposite sides of the wall. So we're going to continue to monitor the situation, as you know we will. Certainly the idea that there's magic in the wall is not new, and certainly the idea that it's blocking other magics is also not new. But on the other hand, Melisandre calls it a hinge of the world, which implies that there's lots of power in it. So some power, some blocking of power. It's a little of column A, a little column B. I guess it depends on the type of magic. We'll have to see. The wall was built to defend against the ancient for- forces of the others, not against the ancient forces of R'hllor. So, uh, considering that the children likely spawned the others using some form of magic and sacrifice and people, who knows? We'll find that out later, I suppose. So it fits thematically that this edifice built to keep out those old powers specifically blocks things like skin changing. Curious, though, that while supposedly blocking the magic of the old gods, yeah, it enhances Melisandre. So that's really, hmm, just keep that in mind. Very, very strange. It will be interesting to see how the wall impacts Bran if he ever gets back there. Yeah, well, is it going to shut his powers down, enhance them, or not have much effect? I really, really wonder. Very, very curious. So John still has his core mission to think of, which involves the supernatural, and finding out what the free folk are up to, what kind of power they have, whether they have any kind of power. We're thinking of the Horn of Winter, of course, and John thinks, hmm, Tormund Hornblower? Does that have anything to do with it? It doesn't seem to. He seems to be looking in the wrong place, but, you know, you could follow his line of thought. It makes sense to at least check in on that. <laughs> but interesting to consider that the it wakes giants from the earth when the supernatural enemy is raising all sorts of things from the earth, dead bodies of all kinds. John is wondering during this chapter if the Night's Watch is going to sneak attack this group of free folk he's with. Well, the group of free folk. He had, obviously doesn't know what's happened at the Fist yet. And he's wondering, hmm, if they attack, I wonder if I could take advantage of the confusion and kill Mance. 
He recognizes that Mance is a special leader, and uniting this group of wildlings takes a rare individual, and that killing him would have it cause it to all fall apart. And this is something I want to talk about briefly, because the free folk way of nominating kings is interesting. The Seven Kingdoms can't just... They can't seem to deal without having a king, as the free folk would mock them. Like, Kneeler's knees will be itching to kneel to somebody. But the free folk only have a king when someone proves worthy of being a king, which is kind of an... I kind of respect that. Of course, the, the methodology to getting to that point is rough, but so is having a Joffrey as king. So... Again, it's like the we- their wedding thing where you're like, well, arranged marriages are really crappy too. Kidnap- like We can't exactly endorse kidnap and rape as a form of marriage, but arranged marriage kind of is the same thing, just with more politeness and uh, nice things attached to it. <clears throat> but at, the- at its core, the-, the woman has no choice in either situation. So we're given a few examples of Manson action as a leader, like like here when he shows his experience dealing with whites while revealing more evidence that G. R. Mormont's plan probably wasn't good. This place was high and strong, and he made it stronger. He dug pits and planted stakes, laid up food and water. He was ready for... Me? Finished Mance Raider. Aye, he was. Had I been fool enough to storm this hill, I might have lost five men for every crow I slew, and still counted myself lucky. His mouth, his mouth grew hard. But when the dead walk, walls and stakes and swords mean nothing. You cannot fight the dead, Jon Snow. No man knows that half so well as me. He gazed up at the darkening sky and said, The crows may have helped us more than they know. I'd wondered why we'd suffered no attacks. But there's still a hundred leagues to go, and the cold is rising. Vermeer, send your wolves sniffing after the whites. I will have the I won't have them taking us unawares. My Lord of Bones, double all the patrols and make certain every man has torch and flint. Steer, Jarl, you ride at first light. So Mance would not have attacked the fist. <laughs> That's what the there's a lot to unpack there. There's a long quote with a lot to say about it. But that's an important, very straightforward point to make. The dead, however, had no problem with that. They are like, yeah, this is this is a, our kind of attack situation. We don't mind taking heavy casualties because, hey, they're not really casualties. And, hey, we'll just get new members of our army by winning this battle. So that's really something. And, well, Varamir using skin-changing powers to scout the dead. Well, that fires the imagination. I mean... John could have a similar ability using Ghost, I suppose, but it's not something he was aware of as a possibility. He's just now becoming a, a warg, so it's not there yet. Maybe we'll get this later. Right now, though, Varamir's doing it. It's pretty cool. We can get an idea again by looking ahead to his chapter and quoting it. Blue-eyed shadows walked amongst the mounds of snow. Some wore brown and some wore black and some were naked, their flesh gone white as snow. A wind was sighing through the hills, heavy with their scents, dead flesh, dry blood, skins that stank of mold and rot and urine. Sly gave a growl and bared her teeth, her rough bristling. Not men, not prey, not these. The things below moved but did not live. One by one, they raised their heads towards the three wolves on the hill. Ooh, yeah. Uh, of course, that's a Dance of Dragons, Varamir. Late in uh, this chapter, they arrive at the fist, and Man summons John just as his face has been eagled. Tormund stands up for John to rattle shirt. He's in Tormund's group now, and, well, Tormund likes John. But, of course, he tells John to go right away if Mance is calling, which is another example of how Mance is seen by everybody, seen and respected by the free folk. As we mentioned in his first chapter, John is just truly overmatched by Mance. He was able to lie to Mance successfully before only because he wasn't really lying. He has no deep-seated emotion to redirect here in this case. He has no experience with lying or mummery, etc. There's no... He's, again, overmatched, I think is the right word. He's also too loyal to the Night's Watch to lie, even when there's really no point in telling... in concealing the truth. Mance calls him out on it and gets the truth. So with all that, you can see John's point, though. 
If he kills Mance, it really would cause the Free Folk to fall apart as a unit. His leadership is extraordinary. But not only is Mance far too skilled and wary for John to kill him, he's not going to get the chance. Mance and Igrit and Jarl and Steer and their group are climbing the wall. Uh, Nina points out the last of the giants also speaks the futility of one living group exiling and exterminating another. When the others come, it doesn't matter who owns the land. Any living thing is going to die and become enslaved by them. We see that even more clearly in Sam's chapter when we get there because we actually see some of these dead things lumbering around specifically. <clears throat> Mance's journey, quote, hammering a hundred different daggers into one great spear is reminiscent of Robar the second Royce and his attempt to unite the veil against the Andals. It's kind of, it harkens back to that because they're both uniting disparate first men groups in a, in, in a act of cultural survivor, survival. Uh, John, John is on this mission for the Night's Watch, but what actually motivates him is his sense of himself as a Stark. A lot of y'all pointed that out, that John is still thinking like a Stark. He's doing his duty to the Brotherhood, uh, to the Night's Watch, rather, but it's his starkness that thinks he's got to defend the North. It's in his blood. That's the thing that's really motivating him even more than anything, which is, yet again, part of him being caught between two worlds. His struggles, Stark in one hand, Night's Watch in the other hand, especially when he's Lord Commander, that's going to get even more difficult. Nina with a great catch. Uh, you know, I love the wordplay, and this is right in there. So all throughout the chapter, quite a bit is made of, of John's cloak. The sheepskin cloak he's now wearing instead of the black cloak of a brotherhood of the Night's, of a brother of the Night's Watch. Well, that makes him a wolf in sheep's clothing. Oh, yeah. Some thoughts from Joe. John's chapter opens with one of the most unique moments in all of A Song of Ice and Fire in terms of someone seeing something they never, ever expected to see in their whole lives. In this instance, it's the ride of the giants. Not one, not two, but hundreds. And I think this is a really important point, not discussed as much as it should be. Somewhere fairly close to the wall, there are presumably still hundreds of giants walking around, and eventually there'll be undead giants walking around. Ooh, that's just terrifying, right? And that's the kind of thing that you gives you a different thought process to their ability to get through the wall. You know, I don't know that giants would be enough to get through the wall, but it, it strikes me that we just talked about how there might be the ones who started building it. So if anyone can, any living creature can take it down other than a dragon, well, the giants, they might have something to do about it. I still think supernatural means are more likely, but it, it bears mention that giants are, well, uniquely suited to things like this. So speaking of seeing things that should not be, we're going to have that moment come up several times when people start seeing the dragons in flight for the first time. Tyrion's going to have that moment pretty soon. Jon will have that moment at some point, probably, although he'll have it through a different perspective, a half-undead perspective, perhaps. Tyrion as well. I'm very curious at what he's going to react to that. Uh, I mean, I actually just said Tyrion. I meant to say um, other characters like Arya and Sansa, just everyone. I, I'm Almost every character has to have a reaction to the dragons, and, and I feel like this is sort of groundwork for that, seeing creatures that are unbelievably fascinating and oh, probably yeah, also, shouldn't be real. A lot of them, we saw their reactions in the show, obviously, but we weren't in their heads. Yeah, they so just You, you see Arya like, staring up at it, but you don't really know how much hope wonder fear she really has swirling around in there it's a great point yeah it's only so, as, even though some of those actors are really amazing with what they can communicate with their facial expressions that you can just do so much more with you know whole paragraphs written by an expert <laughs> so let's see moving on here we compared john's delving into the wildlings uh, 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 as similar to Danny and the Dothraki in weeks gone by. And we can see a lot of that in this chapter as John becomes more and more aware of the wildlings as individuals and realizing that what he's been told as fact is not really reality at all. The giants were the example of that. Like old Nan's story was not very accurate to what giants are like. Before it was just realizing that wildlings and free folk have families, children playing and adults loving like they do. You know, just they're human like we are. But now... There's names to faces, there's in identities, there's individuals, and as we've already pointed out, quite a few of them he likes. 
it makes his task all the harder. Everything would be easy if these were just clumped, bland people, mindless savages, etc. And it is too bad that that is kind of what they were on TV. I mean, they weren't just mindless savages. Well, the Dothraki kind of were. that Kind of. And the Wildlings kind of were. But they had the Fens. Those were kind of mindless savages. But what really was lost is not dis- that they, they were... they distinguished between them, too, to show, yeah. you're not all like this. Exactly. Like, that was at least nice that the Fens were at least a, div- a different type of Wildlings. Where, But hey, really, there that just made folk. it too. Free so, folk. Yeah, you're right. Free folk. Two types of free folk is all we really saw on TV. Whereas this chapter alone shows us that there's there's dozens of types of wild that are extremely distinct from each other. And many of them don't have any contact with each other. It's like how Dornishmen and Ironborn don't have a lot of contact with each other. So, so it would be for uh, people from White Tree Village where Craster was born compared to the cannibal, the river, the ice clan people, ice river clans people, which that's super far away. They don't have roads connecting them, et cetera. Yeah. I will say also it's interesting, you know, with the Dothraki, we don't see a lot of differences between, you know, the different ones. That's true. They have more individual, their their culture is younger, less diverse, and they don't have, uh, in that sense, they have this very broad warrior culture, and they haven't been marginalized and pushed aside by something more powerful. Well, they had yeah. been, and they broke out into what they are now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a good point, though. They're, the Dothraki... You wonder what the free folk would be like if they had the Dothraki Sea. This is yeah. kind of my point. Like, geographically, yeah. there's a huge difference. There's no big wall holding the Dothraki back. Yeah. Well, mm. the Bone yeah. Mountains kind yeah. of are, but yeah. not really, you know. <laughs> Pretty big deterrent. Yeah. So, here we go. Um, Joe points to another really horrifying moment, showing that there's a lot of terror here. Later in, in uh, we're near the end of the chapter we see as we're seeing like the bodies on the fist just a few lines george gets across how terrible this was an impaled horse that john notes is trying to get into the ring of spikes rather than out uh that's terrifying just the the no the the notion of what that means that it was it went it tried to run back inside because of all the undead everywhere and John ha- and John sees this line. John had never seen pink snow before. And it's like, oh, <laughs> that's uh, there's a lot of things he hadn't seen before. That's it's kind of a short, succinct line that says a lot. It's 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 horrifying because of what it implies is is there all the dead bodies, but also it's just another example of John being young and naive still, and, and him not having a lot of worldly experience, especially among the wildlings, uh, excuse me, free folk, which very few people have experience among outside the actual free folk themselves. All right. Uh, questions and answers from y'all. Violent Messiah 666 says, no, I didn't think Sam was dead because he had the dragon glass and figured he had plot armor or more to his story. Aaron M says, I thought John would come across Sam's body on the fist the first time through. And that would, you know, that would certainly do a lot for John's character. Nothing good, but maybe interesting. It would certainly be some conflict. It would also be a way for John to get the dragon glass. That's true. <laughs> just, it's just lying right there. He just picks it up. It's like, oh, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, in, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about why we think the others attacked the fist in Sam's chapter. Igrit asks John to send Ghost away, but unlike Rob sending Grey Wind away sometimes, it's not ominous. But it sort of is because he gets stabbed while Ghost is locked up, not unlike Grey Wind being locked up during the Red Wedding. So, hey, yeah, that's a couple ways to look at that one, I guess, but it's an interesting parallel. Rob and John, direwolves, uh, similar issues happening with their socialization and uh, the, sim- the symbol uh, symbology behind their protection. So, free folk marriage versus arranged marriage. I did that Twitter poll, like I said. 29% said the Seven Kingdoms marriage is worse. Free folk marriage got 23.7% as worse. So, most of y'all, 47.3% said, too close to call. They're both awful. And I can see both sides. I don't really want to get deep into the argument, but the point is, they're both awful. Neither of them are really should be endorsed, I think. And they both, to some form or another, exist in the real world still. There's still arranged marriage in the world, and there's still cultures that... If you uh, impregnate someone against their will, 
that you have to bring the child to term or you have to marry them. It's really terrible. Uh, but again, this isn't comparing two good options. It's comparing two bad options and trying to pick out the very few good parts about them. Anyway, thought that was interesting. And also, unlike most polls, this one had a few people respond to it. Only Usually we have 600, 800, 1,000, sometimes as high as 2,000 people vote. Only about 200 people voted on this one because I think it's just so hard to pick. And even, and even that said, about half of the 200 people picked picked too close to call. So, <laughs> yeah. Patron Paul Barry says, in this John chapter and a couple other times in the book, we see John calm his horse with a quiet word and touch. Do you think this is just good horsemanship or a sign of his growing warging powers? Well, it, that's a good question. You know, we, there's no evidence John can do anything other than slip into ghost. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have some sort of, I don't know, aura, wavelength, brain power that other animals can sense. After all, Vermeer says that skin changers can sense each other immediately. So... There might be some sort of slight calming influence. I mean, there's real people who just animals seem to like and just, you know what I mean? Like without talent, you know, without, I mean, sorry, without That's like learning talent. skill. I'm, I meant to say without skill, without having learned anything. Like, for instance, that, that Cesar guy, the dog whisperer, that guy has a natural talent with dogs, but he's also learned a lot about dogs. Yes. Like he's, you know what I mean? But some people just seem to have animals find them appealing for reasons that humans can't really get at. I, I, so it could be something like that, but I think George might be playing with that concept and, and leaving it open for, to the reader to interpret. Good question, though, for sure. Brendan the Bloodline, our Warden of the West, he says, it amazes me how present crows and ravens are throughout the book. Even on my first read, I was looking out for them, but there are so many more than I remembered. Of course, it always makes me think of Blood Raven, and I think it's really clever of George to make John directly think whether they are wild or not. It is great line that shows the series is really meant to be reread. Yeah, very true. Yeah, there's, uh, in fact, th there's several ravens that we're going to point to in uh, Sam's chapter, and there'll be some good examples of that. <clears throat> Another little bit of the song and music theme comes up when with the repeated pairing of John's words with the crow's song. They're, in other words, they, they, they refer to him as, a crow, and they say they refer to his speech as singing. Well, the crow was singing at me this way when they were referring to John. It's kind of a recurring theme of the way they refer to his talking. And here's an example. Tree Girl caught a specific example that Brandon Lannister was talking about just now. Quote, a raven looked down from a soldier pine and corked as he went past. Is that blood raven? Who knows? Or just a raven? But certainly we can't just look at a raven talking to John as he walks by and ignore it. <laughs> that has to at least make us go, hmm. That's not like we can make some great grand conclusion about it, but yeah, it's true. Anytime you see a raven and it talks, you got to go, hmm. Is a chance that's one of the ones Sam let go? But probably not. Those probably flew back to, winter, or to the wall where they're trained to go. Nina, Nina points out, oh, if only John were related to someone who was really great with horses. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, mm, that's a good point. I should have thought of that. Yeah, in reference to uh, Paul Barry's question, Liana, of course, fantastic horsemanship and John's real mother. So, yeah, I, I really should have caught that one. Good one. Thanks. See, that's why we got to have Nina catching these things for me. And Scott backing her up there. Okay, Robert SoCal, a couple of comments here. This is neat, too. Um, actually, this is a comment I put in the wrong place. So I will come back to this one. In John 1, we briefly discussed Mance's mention that the Free Folk and Night's Watch trade more often than one would think. I've since found at least one example of this, which is looking ahead to Veramir's uh, prologue chapter, Hagen the Skin Changer, who mentioned, mentored Veramir and wound up on the night with the Night's Watch, or rather, uh, wound up regretting it, rather, because Veramir, you know, stole his second life from him. But Hagen traded with the Night's Watch on the regular. We even see this happen in one of Veramir's memories. It doesn't sound like Veramir wanted to trade with the Night's Watch also, but very interestingly, he does dream of living south of the Wall. He, you know, coming so close to the Wall, seeing how warmer it was, and, and realizing that this is the place where all these trade goods come from, it made him think of what else might be down there. A lot of y'all in the chat wondered about Tormund and Mage Mormont, whether Tormund's bear story is actually a Mormont story. Well, I think really it's just a story. 
<laughs> it's just a story story. But it is interesting to think about that, to think about like the bear and the maiden fair where it's reversed, where the, the bear is the maiden fair. <laughs> it's also, you know, in the wrong context, it's kind of gross as a story, but also it fits very well with Weldon culture as kind of a, a humorous version of their way of dealing with relationships and weddings and things like that. But also it's just Tormund. It's just a way to introduce us to Tormund and the kind of character he is. So we still haven't uh, uh, seen um, things back. Sorry, I'm going to start this comment over. It's, it, it's Laura Brondos points out that, uh, or rather brought to our forums, that John may get Mance's cloak. There's a theory out there that she shared with the group. And uh, it's a really interesting idea that one day that John will actually wear Mance's cloak. We brought up the symbology there before that it's black and red, which, hey, those are John's colors. If he were to know that those were his colors or they could be his colors, he may decide to keep the Stark colors or something else. But you can see those as being John's colors anyway. Stephanie the Peerless says John eventually tries to get the watch to see things as he's seen them here, both literally and culturally. And shout out to Girls Gone Canon. They're working on their John arc right now. And this is apparently something that they highlighted for her and she wanted to share it with us. So thanks for that, Stephanie. And thanks to Girls Gone Canon. So, and of course, there's a lot of people, a lot of the commenters and our social media pointed out how there's so much in this batch of chapters for today. There's so much, oh no, because of the foreshadowing where it's leading, meaning the Red Wedding for Rob and Kat, but also here for a grit. It looks so good. It looks like John is having a relationship. It looks nice on first time. Sure, if you think ahead, you're like, well, this can't possibly end well. Can John really, can John and Grit really just go happily ever after? Probably not. But still, it hurts <laughs> to know it's coming. Sansa 2, the one where Sansa outs the Tyrell marriage plot, aka, what you talking about? Willis? A short and seemingly sweet, but actually quite cruel chapter. If you didn't know my reference, I'm referring to Different Strokes, the TV show from the 80s with uh, Gary Coleman, where he would say, what you talking about? Willis. Willis was his brother. I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here's the first line of the chapter. A new gown, she said, as wary as she was astonished. You can tell that the dressmaker knows Sansa has the wrong idea about what the dress is for. But she's able to dodge breaking the bad news. She just uh, kind of is like, yeah, you don't want to know what this dress is really for, but I'm not going to be the one to tell you. It's tough to see Sansa get her hopes up for something, several somethings, really. All at once, she thinks she's going to marry Willis and get a new gown for Joffrey and Marjorie's wear wedding. And the last line is that she can scarcely wait to wear it. But if she knew it was a wedding gown and that Tyrion was her groom-to-be, she wouldn't be scarcely waiting to wear it. It should have been a red flag to hear that the dressmaker has been ordered to set all other work aside and put her entire staff to work on this one dress for Sansa. It's easy to dismiss this as naive, but I think that's a mistake. I'm not even sure it's naive. It's just not expert level. <laughs> I think of us, most of us missed that red flag too. So that's why I wouldn't go so quick to call it naive. But that says something about Sansa's spirit, doesn't it? It can be hard to get your hopes up for anything when you've been given as much fool's gold as Santa has. And, yep, well, she's going to be given more, and yet she'll still get her hopes up again afterwards because she's kind of indomitable that way. Which brings us to Dantos, a fool helping Santa for gold. So, fool's gold, yep, fool's gold again in a different form. Ironically, Dantos tries to break her reverie over Willis Tyrell by educating her on why everyone wants her including Dantos' boss, so he's being a hypocrite. Actually, Littlefinger is worse because he, Dantos says they want you for your claim. Well, yeah, but Littlefinger wants you for your claim and because of his Tully and specifically Catelyn Tully issues, so it's, it is worse. So when he says it's your claim they mean to wed, it's one of those things that's true but elite-level hypocrisy. He says something just as true and just as hypocritical about the Tyrells, too. Quote, When she told Sir Dantos that she was going to Highgarden to marry Willis Tyrell, she thought he would be relieved and pleased for her. Instead, he had grabbed her arm and said, You cannot! 
in a voice as thick with horror as with wine. I tell you, these Tyrells are only Lannisters with flowers. Lannisters with flowers? Mm, I wouldn't go quite that far, but it's not terribly off. And what's funny is that he's reacting to the thought that he's about to get paid 10,000 crowns from Littlefinger, and he's he's seeing that money uh, slip through his fingers. Of course, he was never going to get that money in the first place, but it's still, let's keep track of what's happening here. The sadness of it all grows as we're reminded that Sansa actually spends a lot of time with the Tyrell family unit, a sizable group, and it goes pretty well. She, you know, she likes it for the most part. Quote. The cousins took Sansa into their company as if they had known her all their lives. They spent long afternoons doing needlework and talking over lemon cakes and honeyed wine, played at tiles of an evening, sang together in the castle sept, and often one or two of them would be chosen to share Marjorie's bed, where they would whisper half the night away. So yeah, she enjoys her time with him for sure, and I know, note the singing, and of course she loves the lemon cakes. You know that's going to go over well. Sleepovers. Sleepovers. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. But she's turned off by how naive they are about war. When it comes to talking about war and knights and kissing knights and wanting to marry a knight and killing, that's when she <laughs> takes a bit of a break from the reverie. And thinks this instead. They are children, Sansa thought. They are silly little girls, even Eleanor. They've never seen a battle. They've never seen a man die. They know nothing. <laughs> Their dreams were full of songs and stories, the way hers had been before Joffrey cut her father's head off. Sansa pitied them. Sansa envied them. Mm. Then George goes even further and has Sansa dream of children named after her brothers and father and even Arya, all of them together floating down a river with a lute player and puppies. It's so very pleasant, but obviously that's way too happy <laughs> for it to happen. I mean, Sansa, I think she's got a good chance to get a happy ending at the end of the books. And maybe Willis will, too. It would be a twist if they actually ended up together somehow, but... With it being their choice would be preferred instead of an arranged marriage, but still, it's pretty unlikely. Of course, it's also a case of Sansa maturing in one area, but not the other. It's realistic to show her growth. I mean, everyone, you don't just, growth isn't linear, and you don't just grow all, just because you get experienced in war doesn't mean you learn everything, learn about politics, for example, because that's that's what she's missing here. So she's learning, but clearly has more to learn. And the, the, her time with Marjorie is a major feature of this chapter, and we learn a good deal, so does she, but I think... She may learn even more later when she thinks back on some of these moments and what was actually happening. I'm looking forward to that in Sansa's arc as, as she reviews her own life and looks at things differently as she gets older with new, a new set of eyes. Marjorie is somewhat unusual in that she's a character with a less prominent role in the books than in the show. Part of this is age. I mean, Natalie Dormer can certainly pass for younger but book Marjorie is 16 here, and Sansa, again, is 12. Still, she has a chance to emerge further in the narrative in The Winds of Winter, Marjorie, I mean, and perhaps beyond, particularly as I do not expect a great sept explosion in the books. I mean, that maybe Marjorie gets killed by Cersei in some other way, but I, I'm not so sure about that either. So she's worth noting as a character who may surprise us because her plan, the, George's plans for her may be a lot different. Can I can I say something that is Absolutely. you know not related to this much at all other than you talking about Natalie Dormer looking young? I just yeah. noticed last week when talking to Michael Clarfeld yeah. that Mace Tyrell has the Tyrell nose along with Olena and Marjorie. Oh really? That upturned nose. If you look closer at, at Roger Ashton Griffiths, huh. he has that same exact nose. Mace of base. Yeah. Mace of face. Yeah, they all have the little little piglet nose, kind of. That's cool. Anyway, Good sorry casting. everyone. Sorry everyone, but I was mind blown when I noticed <laughs> that. So there's a decent mystery surrounding Marjorie and her level of knowledge. It's a mystery that applies to most of the Tyrells. Where Elena is pretty much in on everything, if not literally everything, Mace is is not, but maybe more than we think. In the show, Marjorie didn't know about the Purple Wedding. She uh, actually is like, whoa, you did what? But there's skepticism in the book fandom on that front, since Joff and Marjorie drink from the same chalice during the Purple Wedding. It's really hard to believe Marjorie didn't know to be wary of when to drink from the cup that they poisoned Joffrey, which... 
is also part of how they're able to sell it. They're like, well, we wouldn't we wouldn't have risked our own daughter drinking from the same cup is part of what helps the Tyrells avoid suspicion. We bring this up now because a lot of the elements are present here in this chapter, though, even though we clearly haven't gotten to the Purple Wedding yet. Dantos reminds her to wear the hairnet in this chapter. And Marjorie in this chapter is trying to win Sansa over a bit, calling her things like sister, being really being really friendly. It's almost like what Danto says. She's sinking her claws into her, <laughs> but in this case it's her thorns. But doing it very nicely, very friendly, very warmth. You know, there's a lot of warmth in it, but behind it you can sense maybe there's some ambition here. Maybe there's a lot of ambition here. Note again the presence of tidbits about the three siblings, Aemon the Dragon Knight, Nerys, and King Aegon the Unworthy. They come up really often. And I wrote here in the document, I have lost count of how many times they've been referenced, and Nina looked it up for us. She says, the love and supposed, uh, the love and supposed affair of Aemon and Nerys has been mentioned seven times before this, four in A Game of Thrones, twice by Sansa, once by Aemon, Maester Aemon, that is, and once in the appendix. And then three times in The Clash of Kings, G.R. Mormont, Sansa, and the singer in the Red Keep during the Blackwater. Right on. Very good. So it's that's a lot, right? So we, we pointed out when it happens, because we're like, boy, here it comes again. It's nice to have a number on it. This is a particularly fun pattern for me to point out to you, because this pattern, this kind of pattern, that is, it's kind of why History of Westeros podcast exists. If you take everything about George R. R. Martin has said about Aemon the Dragon Knight and Aegon the Unworthy and Nerys throughout all these different sources, and as Nina showed you, it pops up in a variety of places... Take all those references, put them together into one document, script it, and that's that's our that's what we've been doing for years. You get a new story out of that because you can't follow along all of that when it's delivered two sentences at a time spread out across several chapters and books. You can't remember all that. You can't even remember it if you've read the whole book five times. You got to take you got to separate those little items, put them together and look at them as a whole. And that is yeah, like I said, that is basically what a history of Westeros podcast episode looks like in terms of a formulation so no one can so it, it's usual it's not a random anecdote either these are current situations presented as possible parallels to historical ones so here's a quote well here's the quote from this chapter Aegon the unworthy had never harmed queen Nerys, perhaps for fear of their brother the dragon knight but when another of his king's guard fell in love with one of his mistresses, the king had taken both their heads. Sir Loras is a Tyrell, Sansa reminded herself. That other knight was only a Toyn. His brothers had no armies, no ways to avenge him but with swords. Yet, the more she thought about it all, the more she wondered. Joff might restrain himself for a few turns, perhaps as long as a year, but soon or late, he will show his claws, and when he does, the realm might have a second Kingslayer, and there would be war inside the city, as the men of the Lion and the men of the Rose made the gutters run red. Santa's a little surprised they aren't more worried, but decides that surely Lord Tyrell knows what he's doing. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> but Elena does know what she's doing. And let's let's not be let's be clear here. Book Mace is no genius, but He's not as bumbling as Show Mace. He's, he's definitely more capable than that, even if he's not super capable. The Toyn brothers mentioned here, this is really important. This, Sansa mentions that they didn't have armies like the Tyrells do, but they did kill Aemon the Dragon Knight in an ambush. They were trying to kill his brother, the king, Aegon the Unworthy, the one who ordered their brother Terence, the aforementioned Kingsguard who slept with one of Aegon's mistresses. He was tortured to death brutally, so that's why they were coming for him. So it's true enough that the Tyrells could do some serious damage if Marjorie is killed. So, Because even these guys did serious damage without an army, and the Tyrells do have that. But that's part of the trick here. We're made to think of the long-term problems with this marriage, how Joffrey will eventually show his claws. But that's where Sansa's coming up without uh, lack of certain knowledge here, because Olenna's not going to give Joffrey the chance to sink his claws into her or to show them later. She's going to pull them before he gets that shot. And indeed, this passage really feels like it's concealing some foreshadowing beyond the Purple Wedding, I think. Meaning, I think Tommen is going to be murdered as well, though probably not by the Tyrells. And, yeah, and without a marriage, meaning if the Tyrells and Lannisters are not linked by marriage, the men of the Rose and the men of the Lion may indeed make the gutters run red, as Sansa's quote says. The line, quote, and there would be war inside the city. 
that would probably happen too. And who did we say doesn't like the idea of the Tyrells getting power? Varys. Varys is a big part of the reason the Tyrells and Lannisters may be at each other's throats. He kills Kevin and Pycelle in part because he wants Cersei back in charge. Cersei, who is paranoid about the Tyrells getting power and keeps pushing back on them in every way she can, sometimes quite overtly, but also subtly. Both, really. Canceling appointments, interfering with Marjorie and Tommen's time together, things like that. So I believe the death of Tommen could very much be engineered by Varys and perhaps done in a way to make it look like the Tyrells did it, at least enough to make Cersei think it, because Cersei's already paranoid, and it might not be that hard to make her believe it's the Tyrells. One way or another, Vars has to pave the way for Aegon VI, after all. Young Griff's gotta, gotta roll up the red carpet for him. Maybe, just maybe, Marjorie will be betrothed to him, keep on marrying over and over. I, I say Varys doesn't want the Tyrells to take over, but he might be... Totally fine with them as an ally. That's a different look. So this chapter gets into the song theme just a little as well. That was a lot about uh, the Toins and all that. And we'll have more to say about this. It's crazy how much the Toins and the Kingswood Brotherhood pop up this whole episode. So, like I said, the song theme pops up again just a little bit with the girls swing- singing in the sep together. And Ala Tyrell is a good singer and harpist. It kind of comes up just a little bit. And she thinks of when she sang to the Hound. Sansa, that is. And we get the infamous false memory. Sansa recalls the Hound kissing her, but he did not. We see that scene from her POV, and there is no kiss. Sansa is also learning some sarcasm, perhaps. This one is kind of awkward, huh? Quote, King Joffrey has such beautiful lips, Mega gushed, oblivious. Oh, poor Sansa, how your heart must have broken when you lost him. Oh, how you must have wept. Joffrey made me weep more often than you know, she wanted to say. But Butterbumps was not on hand to drown out her voice, so she pressed her lips together and held her tongue. <laughs> that was a good mega there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really, really embody mega. <laughs> For fun, also, here's... this is an example of Butterbumps doing what you were talking about with Elena, of kind of muddying the waters, <laughs> of, of being brash and, and covering things up. That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> so here's what... Here's a quote that shows what Sansa really thinks of Joff's lips. This is from A Clash of King Sansa 5, so we're going back a little bit for this two sentences. His plump pink lips always made him look pouty. Sansa had liked that once, but now it made her sick. And then later in this book, she's going to have this quote, which I just have to include this because it fits so well. A book. Sansa wondered if Joff removed those fat, wormy lips of his when he read. <laughs> that's right. That's when Tyrion gives Joffrey the book as a gift for his wedding gift, which, of course, he chops in half. So irony and bitter sarcasm was definitely not what she expected <laughs> from her, uh, her marriage and all this stuff. So, yeah, something to look forward to. Some thoughts from Joe. Firstly, we get an update on Sansa's journey through puberty. It's it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of uncomfortable because, you know, you talking about her body changing and all that. But Uncomfortable for you. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean. Less so for me and all the other women reading. Right. It's, well, that's what I'm getting to. It's interesting because it's probably, it's another example where it seems to be, at least from, from people who have commented, it seems fairly authentic. And like George didn't just come shoot from the hip and just invent this stuff. I agree. Cool. All right. That's good to hear. And also, it, it's something that a lot of women would certainly understand, like being stared at by men, older men or not. Just that's real. That's very realistic. And uh, it's an important part of putting ourselves in Santa's shoes and seeing what it's like to be like her uh, and how creepy everyone around her is most all the time. And, and, with, and her not fully able to understand what, what it all means. Uh, Joe also points out something a little uncomfortable. Uh, Jane Poole is still out there at some point. She's still currently, like right now, being, you know, taught uh, by Littlefinger. Ugh, yeesh. Yeah. So uh, Sansa is probably doesn't want to think about that, although she wouldn't know what to think. She doesn't know where Jane is at this point. Uh, Violent Messiah, 666. Super chat for the watch. Shea is the best. Aziz isn't too shabby either. I'm kind of shabby, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a decent enough at talking. <laughs> Will you mess your hair up, Aziz? Should I mess it up? Yeah. This is my perfect chance because you look a little shabbier. 
I'll there. get shabbier. Okay, now there I'm shabbier. you go. That's a lot better. <laughs> Thanks. A couple of great takes from Nina here. Sansa is immediately distrustful of the source of this new gown, which speaks less to her naivete than to her experiences of betrayal. This is what I was talking about with the fool's gold. She knows not to trust Cersei, but doesn't quite know what the Tyrells want out of her either, other than a betrothal between her and Willis. She knows that much. So there's almost too many options to pick from in terms of what might motivate this gift. She just she knows that there's a lot of reasons why this could be coming, but and there's a lot of reasons it could go wrong, but she doesn't see the one that it actually turns out to be. Definitely, she thinks, Nina thinks Marjorie knew about the Purple Wedding, gives a good argument for it, uh, which I agree with, but she thinks that uh, Mace does know. That's one did know, which is, I'm less sure, but she also thinks Garland knew. So we'll keep that in mind. We'll we'll not do that today. We'll talk about it during the actual Purple Wedding. We can get our thoughts a little more organized, but I would love to hear from you all as well. So drop your thoughts uh, in advance of the Purple Wedding when you get the chance, if you are so inclined. So the Sansa's chapter here was kind of short. It was only 16 minutes. As I said, the average length uh, is 35. But there's a lot to say about this one. Super chat from Maura Lee. Uh, the pear and apple, amazing. Thank you very much, Maura. Most appreciate that. Some people wonder, will Sansa actually get those kids she's naming? In the span of the books, maybe not, unless they have a time jump at the end. But I hope so. I definitely believe she will stick to those names. I think uh, maybe she'll add, maybe she'll get one or two more names that she decides are important. But I, I think that's not too much to hope for. Tree Girl points out Sansa is uh, Sansa's reduced visits to the Godswood must have been particularly alarming for Dantes because yeah, she's she mentions casually that she's not going as much, and that yeah, that would have to freak him out about his ten thousand gold crowns. <laughs> So, a little more about the Toyn brothers to finish this chapter, because I want to set you all up for what's coming in this next chapter, which is Arya 3. And in that, in Arya 3, we get the story of the Brotherhood Without Banners, their origin story. And as part of that, Tom O'Sevens actually sings a song that starts with the line, the Brothers of the Kingswood. And the Kingswood Brotherhood formed because of these Toyns. The Toins tried to assassinate Aegon the Unworthy. They failed, but they did kill Aegon, Aemon the Dragon Knight in the process. As a result, their house was extirpated. Basically, they were they lost their charter, so to speak. They were uh, exiled and declared outlaw. And, well, they certainly did do that. Many generations later, the Toyn named Simon became leader of the so-called Kingswood Brotherhood that Jaime fought against, that Sir Arthur Dane led against, that Gerald Hightower did his deal so it's uh even Merritt Frey uh, was involved with that he of the epilogue chapter in this book so it's really neat uh it's inspired me to to make this as a shorter topic elsewhere but I wanted to at least tease the Kingswood Brotherhood stuff because it's one of those examples of take all the tidbits said about the Kingswood throughout all the different chapters and books and you get a nice full full-ish story and now Arya 3, the one with the BWB origin story, a.k.a. the gang chases Arya. It's a good look at commoners taking charge of the situation, whereas mostly we've seen them fairly helpless. They're, they're omnipresent, but they're mostly just, they don't, they mostly lack agency. And so it's nice to see that changing a bit, even though they're not all commoners, but most of them are. Quote. The rains came and went, but there was more gray sky than blue, and all the streams were running high. If this weather seems similar to the weather in her mother's chapter, well, again, as I said in that chapter, they aren't that far from each other, geographically speaking. So, and as I said at the end of Sansa's chapter, we mentioned that House Toyn and this attempt at Aegon the Fourth's life indirectly led to the formation of the Kingswood Brotherhood. Thomas Seven sings of them as well. And there's even more synchronicity when we note that last week, Jamie too we had, where he has memories of his time as a squire and his first action against the Kingswood Brotherhood. So... Yeah, it's, it's again funny to think about what if, if Thomas Evans actually encountered Jamie, he would have sung about the Kingswood Brotherhood to a man who knew them up close and personal. He'd be like, you know what, that lyric, you could change that lyric or, you know, maybe add this part. <laughs> Jamie may also know that one of the men captured when the Kingswood Brotherhood was defeated is named Ulmer. The reason might know of him in particular is not just that he was captured, but that he put an arrow through the hand of the Lord Commander, the Kingsguard, Sir Gerald Hightower, a.k.a. the White Bull. 
Sir Gerald had to quit his leadership of the mission to destroy the Kingswood Brotherhood because of this arrow, and it's an ironic thing for Umwell to brag about, because in his place came Sir Arthur Dane. <laughs> it's like, whoops. <laughs> Sir Arthur was far more effective than Sir Gerald, and he ended the Brotherhood after changing up the campaign strategy. So you could say that Ulmer's arrow, though it sounds like and it was an amazing shot, actually indirectly led to the end of his Brotherhood of the Kingswood. This is perhaps all something Jamie could have told them over a tankard of ale had he been willing. They'd probably not believe it, but Jamie could tell them Ulmer was the equal to Angai. And he'd probably be right. Ulmer seems to be the, Inca, the equal to Angai. But he would be saying was, and he should be saying is. Ulmer is still alive. Ulmer survived the fist of the first men, and he's going to survive Craster's Keep. He's not going to turn bloody like many of the men with Arya will. And Ulmer doesn't take part in the mutiny. So he escapes back to the wall. Being an outlaw teaches you survival skills, I suppose. There is This is also a useful thing to keep in mind because we may see the Brotherhood fight the Army of the Dead. It happened on TV, sort of. Things are so very different in general with the Brotherhood, but it still kind of fits because they're already starting to follow R'hllor. And, you know, R'hllor is very well aligned against the Armies of the Dead and the Armies of Ice, so... That does at least seem to be leading in that direction. The concept of how and why normal people become outlaws is explored here, and it, of course, is explored more later in A Feast for Crows, but this is a great piece of it right here. Quote, We'd been sent out by the king's hand to deal with outlaws, you see, but now we were the outlaws, and Lord Tywin was the hand of the king. And after that, they discuss Jaime Lannister on the loose, which, unbeknownst to them, is going to turn this war-torn region into something even worse. Because it's not going to be long from now that the Karstark men are going to plague the area looking for Jaime, and they have no allegiances. They don't care about the small folk. They don't, they don't care about much at all. They're broken men with ambition, uh, a rather awful combination. They're not as bad as the Bloody, bloody Mummers, but they're bad, and they're more numerous than the Bloody Mummers, I believe. So this is going to, we're going to start seeing this as soon as the next chapter, Arya's next chapter, that is. Though the life of outlaws is typically short, I mean, look at how many times Beric has died. Most of the characters named in this chapter are still alive even now in, as we head into the Winds of Winter. Harwin's alive. Greenbeard, Angai, Lem, Tom, Jack, be lucky. His luck has held out so far. Yeah, they're all alive. They may not live as long as Ulmer, but they've learned from the same kind of survival school, you know? <laughs> so it's a little ironic then that Harwin tells Arya he's no longer her father's man, but he'll become her mother's man. <laughs> the Brotherhood talks about how they follow Robert despite him being a dead king, so why not Beric, a dead man, and then Stoneheart, a dead woman. But not all of them are going to follow Lady Stoneheart. Your experience is enhanced if you pay attention to the outlaws as individuals. I mean, your experience as a reader you see which of these individuals become broken men and which of them keep some sense of honor and justice and decency about them. It's interesting to follow their individual paths through that and what and they navigate all these difficulties and, and just tragedy and trauma all around them. Ari has a dream of being stuck in the mud outside Winterfell, being so close but never getting there, each step harder than the last. There are wolves in this dream, too, though it doesn't seem to be a wolf dream since it's her perspective, not a wolf. She's not inside the wolf's head. But she tastes blood when she sees them. So it's kind of a reminder of wolf dreams. It's sort of maybe a crossover of sorts. I'm not sure. I'm not entirely clear what's happening there. But it's very interesting. And it's very short. Now, here's a fantastic line meant only for rereaders. I wish I had a good, mean dog, said Arya wistfully, a lion-killing dog. She'd had a dire wolf once, Nymeria, but she'd thrown rocks at her until she fled to keep the queen from killing her. Could a dire wolf kill a lion, she wondered? <laughs> Ooh, a, a lion-killing dog, a good mean dog. Well, don't you won't have to wait long there. Sandor's on his way. Don't worry, Arya. He, he's coming. Angai is so very important to this group. Though Thoros and Beric draw the most attention, this guy is unbelievably skilled. They eat really well because he just keeps shooting birds out of the sky. A duck in the last chapter, a goose in this one. <laughs> what, a, what a benefit to have around. Really, though, Beric and Thoros haven't even appeared on screen yet. Well, not this book anyway. Obviously, they've both been on screen before, but not since they've joined the Brotherhood. But there's a lot of talk about them, about their leadership 
in the formation of the brotherhood, which is noteworthy, but the descriptions of resurrection that comes to, uh, or it doesn't sound like resurrection. It's, it's couched as just great healing, but mm, we know what's going on. And not only that, they mention the reading of the flames. We're told Thoros is seeing there, seeing things there, perhaps in a manner similar to Melisandre. And this helps explain why the Brotherhood is so effective, having you know an additional intelligence service based in the supernatural. You can see why that would help. So as we were comparing with the comparisons of John to her mother, uh, his mother rather, here's Arya being com- so often compared to Lyanna, and here, well, it's flat out said. You ride like a Northman, milady, Harwin said when he draw when he'd drawn them to a halt. Your aunt was the same, Lady Lyanna, but my father was master of horse, remember? And though this betrayal stinks, it kind of stings a little bit to see Arya have this happen. In the scheme of things, they just want to sell her back to her family. They just want some money for her. That's not really that bad. They're not going to mistreat her along the way. But, of course, that's not going to happen because the Hound and the Red Wedding are going to get in the way. Yeah, I mean, how, how much would you judge if someone found someone's dog and they wanted, a, a you know, a reward? I think I would if they just ransomed the dog and said, I will not give it. <laughs> but if they yeah. wanted a reward, like, I don't I don't know that I think the that they would have just not let them have her if i'm a, well look at let's look at it the other way if i'm some extremely rich family and someone's got my dog you're just gonna, I'm do gonna it. give them some money yeah i'm gonna offer them some reward money yeah you know? so they really probably weren't worried about any chance that they wouldn't get said reward yeah like he's of course they're gonna pay us for aria it's funny how aria's worried they would say they may not take me because i'm yeah. i'm all dirty he's like oh come on aria yeah. <laughs> your mom loves you all right, so uh, Nina offers a few thoughts on the Kings with Brotherhood as well to expand this uh, subtopic. She says how the, they echo the best and worst of the Brotherhood without banners as well. The people of the Kingswood look to the Kingswood Brotherhood to defend them, much as the people of the Riverlands do to the Brotherhood without banners. But they also assaulted and robbed highborn travelers. That's what Ulmer did with Gerald Hightower. He stole a kiss from Elia Martell. And as the brother without banners was planning to do with Jamie and Brienne, it's, it's very similar: capture highborn people, ransom them, etc. This is the outlaw playbook. And the Kings of Brotherhood also did with like Jane Swan and Brother with Banners is doing it with Arya. So Simon Toyne might have been an attainted nobleman, kind of like Beric Dondarrion, not personality wise, but circumstance wise. But in his quest for familial vengeance against the crown, he was more like. Lady Stoneheart, because Beric isn't about revenge. Beric is about taking care of the people, whereas Simon Toyne has this kind of running blood feud with House Targaryen, whereas that does sound more like Lady Stoneheart, because she really, really wants to get the Freys and Lannisters. Good take there. Uh, Yeah, Arya and Nina with another really good catch here about Lyanna. Arya is riding hard in this scene, rushing off. Might this might be really, really close to where Lyanna rode off to go meet Rhaegar near the tournament of Harrenhal. After all, we are not far from Harrenhal, and in the world of ice and fire, it says that this all happened between Lyanna and Rhaegar, not quote 10 leagues from Harrenhal, hmm, near, and this is always happening during the time of Brandon about to marry Catelyn at River Run, which is also we're about to have a wedding at River Run. So, there's a lot of historical parallels to that going on here that's really cool and nina says i bet liana rode hard and fast to meet up with rhaegar too yeah i bet she did <laughs> bet she yeah i bet she rode hard and fast when she was with rhaegar <laughs> <Yeah, ayo. laughs> and guys insistence that barrack always has a trial before you hang someone is ominous because they're kind of joking about it like yeah give him a trial then then murder them but it's you don't mind it so much when they're doing it to awful people, but they're going to do it to Brienne and Podrick and, and Heil Hunt a little later. I don't mind Heil Hunt so much, but <laughs> Podrick and Brienne, hey, let them go. And that might be where that plot line is leading. I, I agree with the theory that Lady Stoneheart may accept a trial by combat or may enforce a trial by combat on Jamie and Brienne will stand as his champion. She already yelled sword, after all. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, Joe, with an interesting thought here, talking about, again, the 
Lord of Light aspect here in R'hllor and how Thoros is looking into the flames. Harwin remains semi-ambiguous about how far his religious beliefs go, but Greenbeard reminds us here that a good percentage of the Brotherhood are already accepting R'hllor, and that's going to keep happening. And we, it's interesting that we saw that in, on the TV show that Melisandre actually interacted with them, and that was part of, the com- part of their combining Gendry and Edric into one character. So that wasn't needed here. But the idea that Melisandre could come in contact with the Brotherhood later and that they will have things to talk about. I mean, they're both going to be R'hllor worshippers. So I could see the show being at least sort of on the right track there as far as the books. And this makes a lot of sense to me because religious uprisings, a lot of times they start at the bottom. And the bottom, I don't mean that. I mean the bottom socially, like the, the social ladder, not the bottom in terms of the worst people. Sometimes it is the worst people, but that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Okay, a couple of more thoughts from y'all. A uh, super chat from Sir Roland de Stark. Love Valar Rereda streams. They bring me so many hours of happiness. When is Dance of the Dragons Part 2 with Radio Westeros coming? Actually, that's coming pretty soon. I wrote another 1,500 words on that Thursday. Lady Gwyn has, I believe, written all of her parts, so they're waiting on me to write I mean, only about 3,000 more words, I think, maybe even less. It'll be out in February. I, I, I'm, I get myself in trouble making predictions about when things are coming out, but we're so close, and I'm so ready. That uh, and it's only February second, so twenty six days <laughs> to get it out to to make that promise come true. Jordan Alexander says, "I wonder if him shooting a duck is foreshadowing for shooting duck on Fagon's team." Huh? Hey, never thought about that yet. Yeah, Raleigh Duckfield. It's possible Angai is still alive, but you know what? I I think it's actually not unlikely that Angai will join Fagon's team. He's from the Dornish Marches, so the Stormlands area uh, or, or the, yeah, the Stormlands area of the, of where it leading into Dorne. And that's the, a big part of Fagon's base support. And, uh, he's with Edric Dane, meaning Angai is, and Edric Dane was, so he's one of the honorable guys. Angai and Edric was on the side of the group that didn't stay with Lady Stoneheart. So he might want to try to go legit again. And joining a new king, sweeping in, you know, taking over and all that might be the perfect chance for them to find a new start, so to speak. Brendan, the bloodline, another question here. Like the line in our, uh, he said, she said, ah, he says that even dogs are joining the brotherhood, which is really cool. That's where we quoted that Arya line about how she wanted a, uh, a mean dog of her own. She immediately wishes she had a lion-killing dog. Obviously, that is also Nymeria. We, we, we're talking about the Hound, but it's it, Brendan correctly brings up Nymeria killing the uh, some of the bloody mummers who are, well, they're no longer in the Lannister employ, but they're just as dangerous. They may as well be. <laughs> it doesn't really matter which side they're on. They're, they're a big threat to Arya. And it's neat, too, just the, the idea that not just the commoners are this groundswell of support for the Brotherhood, but even the animals, the dogs, it's so neat. Even like things like that, it just goes to show how uh, well united the people are. Even the animals want to, want to kick out the bad. One exception for the Brother Without Banners living on is Alan. Alan is mentioned as really crucial to helping the Brotherhood restore order to their ranks when they're ambushed by the mountain. And Alan is one of the Winterfell men. His fate isn't mentioned in this chapter, but sadly he's dead. So uh, maybe even later in that battle. It just his fate isn't mentioned, but we know he dies. Uh, so that's too bad. And we'll close out this chapter with some humor still about uh, with between Gendry and Arya, even though they don't have their comic relief hot pie around anymore. Gendry says, the way it's raining, we'll have moss growing from our ears before long, Gendry complained. Only from our south ear, Arya declared stubbornly. (laughs) There was no use trying to convince the bull of anything. Still, he was the only true friend she had now that Hot Pie had left them. Yep. Arya's friendship with Gendry and Hot Pie is is wonderful. It's too bad that Hot Pie is not around, but you see, she still thinks of him. Okay, our last chapter of the day is Sam's first ever. Yay. A lot of people are really excited that we're getting to this one. It's such a great chapter. Uh, like, I, like I brought up during John's chapter, it was a relief for a lot of people to find out he was still alive. It was 
Good that his body wasn't found because that probably built hope in some people's minds. He does have a more distinct look than most brothers would have, being so big as he is. You would think his body would have been seen if it was there. We call this one the gang flees the fist, a.k.a. the one where Sam's a slayer. Sometimes we ask you questions. This time I want to know how surprised you were. Like, uh, not that he was uh, going beyond him being alive. Like, that's a question I've already asked you. I mean, how surprised were you when you found that he was a POV? So, some of you, it was a double surprise. Like, I thought he was dead, but he's got a POV. So, this first line, quote. Sobbing, Sam took another step. Not just the first line of this chapter, but the first line of his entire arc, I, I remind you. And it's not the worst way to describe his life so far. Yeah, I think it's perfect. Yeah, it's, this is one of those really amazing five words. <laughs> and it's like, wow, that really... <laughs> Describes why I like Sam so much right there. <laughs> you love seeing Sam suffer. I mean, You're crying, so mean. suffering, he perseveres. He takes no. another step. He's terrified. He's sobbing. He's a man who is still crying. And it, yeah. You love to see his person exactly. You love we joke about you loving him crying, but you love his perseverance. That's yeah. the point. Yes. I love him crying too. A lot of men in the series just wouldn't be crying. That's in true. In real life, I don't like a lot of men just wouldn't be crying. That's true. It's 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 a, it's a good portrayal. And it's not something that's been true for the you know, the history of humankind. There's been times in like Achilles cry like the ancient yeah. Greeks where the it was crying was, was very noble. Yeah, it was just like, yeah, sure. And and we see it in a Song of Ice and Fire, the, who is it? The, uh, the, the Weeping the, Men? The, the Carthine. Oh, they cry the Carthine, all the time. Yeah, they, yeah, you're right. They, of course. It's considered no, no like it's, yeah, it's the opposite. Yes. It's like it's manly. <laughs> so, yeah. and that's, uh, that's realistic. So he's got to move to Car. <laughs> that's right. Sam needs to go to Car. <laughs> so this would be an awesome line to use again in his final chapter, right? Like imagine, but he's, Barely able to walk, tears streaming down his face, overcome as he walks towards Gilly in preparation to marry her. See, I got you there. You thought I was going to give some sort of tragic last chapter. But no, that's a happy ending. <laughs> and maybe it's a bit to hope, a bit much to hope for happy ending. We already just kind of tried to give Sansa one in this in this uh, episode. But I think Sam's on the m m more likely end to have something of a happy ending, you know, marrying Gilly. Certainly the show gave us hope that he'll have a happy ending in the books. So, yeah, I mean, even though George says bittersweet ending, his that's his words, bittersweet when you have 300 plus characters or whatever the number is, some of them have to have happy ending. I mean, they can't have them all have bad endings, right? So to me, bittersweet means some good, some bad, some of both, you know? Anyway, the end may seem like a thousand miles away, but you know what they say, right? A journey of a thousand miles starts with no, not a single step. I got you again. It starts with giving up, lying down, being picked up by one of the only people on the planet capable of carrying you named Small Paul. <laughs> then the journey of a thousand miles continues when that person is killed by an other. Uh, but they pull the blade from the White Walker's hand because they're so large, giving you a chance to be perhaps the first person to kill an other in 8,000 or so years. So... I say perhaps because one or two may have been killed by the free folk and because 8,000 years right might be the wrong date reckoning. But nonetheless, this is the way of Sam the Slayer and we must not question it. And now you know how to manage a journey of 1,000 miles. He doesn't actually collapse after the line sobbing. He took another step. He collapses after the sixth time that line comes. And nine times he is cited as sobbing in this chapter overall. It's understandable given the circumstances but it's notable as well that after this chapter, after he slays the other, he only sobs two more times the entire rest of the entire series. Ooh, I said entire twice. Three times, really. <laughs> when Joe tells it, or when John tells him he's going to the Citadel is one of the times he sobs. And when Eamon dies, he sobs. And you can't blame him for that. I mean, how dare you for saying that name right now and right here? <laughs> Move along right now. <laughs> yeah, come on now, really. I mean, you just say that. Amen. Yeah. All right. George combines terror with humor and wordplay with the undead bear here. A brother screams, A bear! A bear! when he sees it coming, which is how the bear in the Maiden Fair song starts as well. <laughs> When Sam is being carried and Gren suggests singing the bear in the main fair, he's like, no, please, no, do not. And Sam also sees an undead giant. 
why not? They can raise any corpse as far as we can tell. So we're going to be seeing some other things down the line, other crazy, creepy, undead things, maybe dire wolves, maybe elk. I don't know. Uh, more bears, uh, lions. Um, How about bears with chainsaws? Whoa. Yikes. Chain, undead chainsaw bears? Yeah. That's terrifying. Yeah. What undead about, what shark about mammoths. more relatable undead chainsaw bears <laughs> who hate Mondays? Okay. <laughs> anyway. Well, there'll be undead birds. I don't know about that. They, can they still fly? I mean. Oh, that's interesting. The idea of undead birds, actually. Yeah. Hmm. You know, you wonder if it's if they're still capable of that. Uh, or maybe they'll just be incapable of flying, but they still be just rising from the dead and just hopping just along hop along. <laughs> creepily. <laughs> oh, God. Yikes. Anyway, just imagine an animal, imagine it dead, and, you know, there you go. There's some lore in this chapter, of course. I mean, we get an other walking on snow without making a mark. We've seen that before, but it's, it's you know, it's a reminder. This is like the others in the opening prologue of Game of Thrones. Um, it's also reminiscent of the children, because they never leave tracks when they pass through a wood. So this is maybe a hearkening of their connection to, a little bit. But it was also the children, apparently, who told humanity of the weakness in the White Walkers, that the children know that Dragon Gloss is the kryptonite of Westeros, where the others are concerned. It implies a certain knowledge that would fit with the same idea that they were the ones who made them in the first place. In other words, if you're going to create Ice Knight necromancers, maybe give them a weakness in case they get out of hand. And this weakness is, well, it's pretty straightforward. It's the Dragon Glass and, and Valyrian Steel, apparently. Or things like that. The problem is that the humans have forgotten about this weakness and things like the cash that go ghost finds are needed, but there was no explanation along with the cash. The children didn't like leave a note or anything. Now the Night's Watch staked out the fist because they expected to fight humans there. It wasn't a good idea, but it backfired even worse when an enemy who actually thought, hey, this is a good setup for us, showed up. We see a, a lot of what not to do, in other words. This is how not to fight the dead. Some of these lessons were learned long ago, and apparently they need to be relearned now. As Gior says, well, I forget if it's in book one or two. I think book one, he says, yes, fire. You know, we should have remembered to burn the dead. We should have known. He's, he's expressing a very basic fact about how to deal with the dead. Yeah, fire works. That's, nah. That's one of the most simplest parts they learn. But even that had to be relearned. The brothers are not fighting the dead the way the dead need to be fought. That's kind of a bottom line here. At first, at the, in Sam's memories, at first he, he's thinking of how at first they were just using regular arrows, not flaming. Eventually they start using fire arrows. Pretty quickly they start using fire arrows. But the first few like flights of arrows are are just blank arrows, which is an utter, utter waste. That does nothing to the whites. Arrows are one of the weakest way methods of fighting against the undead if they're not lit on fire or not made from dragon glass or something. Just regular arrows, they can ignore that pretty easily. Sam thinks in his next chapter that hundreds of fire arrows must have been loosed. And it wasn't enough. They needed to be shooting those right away. But even if they had, it doesn't sound like it would have been enough. It sounds like with all the panic and being overwhelmed and being unprepared for this particular enemy, it, it may not have made enough difference. I'm, I tend to lean that way. But it's, I would have, would have been curious to see how much better they would have done if they were actually prepared properly. Sam sends some letters off, then writes more messages and sends those birds off without the messages. So he... He does well to think ahead. It's smart. It's kind of kind of thing that you wouldn't expect the average Night's Watch brother to think of. But a little bit of panic gets in his way. So it's kind of like a half and half of what we see in the show. In the show, he doesn't send any birds off, if I remember correctly. But here he sends some off and then fails to send the rest. So it's, yeah, anyway. While packing up his stuff, we're glad to specifically see Sam grab the broken horn, the one many of us suspect might actually be a threat to the wall. And Sam will take it with him to the Citadel. He might regret that just as Euron is thanking him for it and taking down the wall with it. Maybe, maybe. But that leads us to a big, big theory, which is that the presence of the horn on the hit fist might be specifically why the others came for it. I mean, they didn't send this huge army up against the wildlings who you got to figure they'd love to break off a big chunk of that and turn it into part of their army. Instead, they go for this small group of Night's Watch, only 300 or some, 
and send uh, you know a large attack at them. Uh, the first time we've seen the others since Waymar Royce, and uh, that's notable from a strategic perspective. Like, what is their objective here? I don't think it's just random. Oh, hey, there's humans here. Let's get them. Nah. They have intelligence. It's not clear what level of intelligence, what level of goal, if it's anything other than just wipe out all life, all humans anyway, but they use some intelligence and strategy in that. And it's another minor tragedy, though, despite the horn being with Sam, he grabs some dragon glass arrowheads and, and a spearhead. They were not being used in this battle, and most of it was left on the fist during their flight. And I don't know that Mance's group finds it either, which is interesting. Um, I don't think anything's said about that. So some of the same chaos and desperation and abject mania present at the Battle of Blackwater is here as well as in, in Sam's memories. But instead of sheer scale and wildfire, we have supernatural and winter. It's a smaller battle, but it's more terrifying in a lot of ways. We also have a much different presentation. Everything is Sam's memory rather than several chapters of action. But somehow it's just as intense. Though, you know, clearly it's a lot shorter. Furthermore, while it may be just as interesting to read about, it's not nearly as pivotal an event on the in-world stage. That range, like I said, that ranging was doomed from the start. It's more about what we learned from it than, oh my God, look what they're capable of. This change, oh, the Brotherhood, the, the Night's Watch is broken now. Well, they were already pretty broken. Big love for Gran the Arox here. And we can call him that because he's the one who later tells Sam it's the intent that matters when you're using someone's nickname. He specifically says, when my friends call me Orax, I, I'm okay with it. When Sir Alistair does it, he's mocking me. And he can tell the difference. Gran, you know, not this considered the smartest dude. That's a pretty wise, you know, thing to say. And he's talking about Sam the Slayer here. But this is later. He talks about Sam the Slayer and says, look, no, when I say it, I'm not mocking you. Yeah, some people might be mocking you when you say it, but I believe it and I was there. And that's really big. Gren witnesses this, so he knows it's true. This isn't a story. Sam, because when Sam tells other people, he feels their distrust. He feels their disbelief. Like Cotter Pike is like, Did you, you didn't really kill another. And Sam understands where they're coming from. How can he, an admitted coward, expect them to believe that he killed an other? Like, that's wild. But Gren witnessed it, so there's just no way around that. And But more importantly, he absolutely, absolutely refuses to leave and abandon Sam. It's his, that's, he talks about what makes him Orox, big and stubborn. And this is the most noble use of stubbornness I can imagine, just refusing to leave your friend in need. But Gren, being a huge man, he still can't handle Sam. That's lucky Small Paul is there. And Small Paul dies redeemed, probably saving everyone in the group because he, when he dies, the other loses his sword. And that's not an accident either. This is Small Paul being very brave in death. He tries to, even after he's stabbed, he tr leans into the stabbing to try to grab the White Walker. And that almost certainly helped pull the blade away from him because you know the white walkers are so graceful and smooth they probably was just prepared to pull the sword right back out and let small paul die he did not expect small paul to lean into the stabbing to try to grab the other and that well that was a brave badass moment there a good way to go out and it's a really sad wonderful extra detail that small paul even though he was willing to kill humans he knew exactly which horse this was. The other came in on a dead horse, and he's like, that's Morny's horse. Like, ooh, this kid, he, he knew which horse it was. So, yeah, pretty sad. Nina looked up some fun details about the Tarleys, which gives us some great perspective on what's happening in the scene. The Tarley sigil is a striding huntsman, so it's fitting that this chapter begins with Sam thinking about walking and ends with him killing an enemy. And his house is founded by Harlan the Hunter and Herndon of the Horn. Of the Horn. So he's really embodying House Tarly there. He's got the horn. And even though he's the hunted, he kills... Well, he kills the, the greatest kill anyone's had in thousands of years. Like, talk about a prize kill there. 
Sam managed to think clearly about what to write based on what he can see. This is Nina writing about um, the messages and how this is an interesting kind of forethought that that Sam exudes here or, or shows here. And we wonder how that's going to play out later with him thinking ahead. Maybe the reason the other confronts Sam and Small Paul, again, we brought this up, is the horn of Jorman. If they think that's their way to get through the wall, they want it. Now, it brings up other questions that I hadn't didn't bring up when we talked about this uh, a moment ago, which is how could they blow it? I mean, it is broken. Can the others fix the horn? Can they just like fill it out with ice or something? <laughs> fill in the cracks with ice? I don't know. And uh, let's see here. From Joe, a couple of thoughts. After 18 chapters devoted mostly to the goings-on of politics in the center of the continent on far-off Essos, or rather, or far-off Essos, we finally return to the cliffhanger of horror George dangled us on at the beginning of this book. Yeah, isn't that wild? We come back to it. This is week four, and we're doing four to five chapters a week. We're about... I looked up for the end. I, I, I like to keep track of how far we are through things, and we're... After this chapter, we'll be more than one-fifth, but less than one-fourth of the way through the book. And since this chapter is right at the end of this little jaunt, we can say pretty specifically that, yeah, that's a long way to come before coming back to it. And as Joe points out, it's 18 chapters. But it's also a bit of a pattern for George. Davos's first chapter isn't quite so far away from the prologue in A Clash of Kings, but it's a similar sort of device where he gives us a prologue with a secondary character in that prologue who then becomes the POV later, which is what happens here. Chet's the POV, Sam's in that chapter, but it's really Sam's POV that's being built up, just as Crescent builds up Davos's. So that's kind of neat. I like that. Also, Joe points to how Arya constantly has to look over her shoulder in fear of Boltons and Bloody Mummers, and she's always like, oh, they're about to catch me. And so, and even though those are about as bad, I mean, what's worse in human form than the Boltons and Bloody Mummers? Somehow this is worse. <laughs> it, it, you know, you don't, the others wouldn't torture you, but it's more terrifying somehow because it's supernatural and it, it's it's unreal. And Sam's terror is greater than Arya's. Arya's worried, but Sam is more worried. Even if Arya has more to worry about, arguably, she's handling it better. Outwardly, obviously, Sam handles it pretty darn well by the end of things, but Arya never just sits down in the snow and gives up for a minute either, so we're, we're being fair. <laughs> and Joe also points to how Sam is, how terrifying this chapter is, even though only a little bit of it is, is firsthand. We, most of it is Sam's memory, and he, he has that moment where he thinks of this terrible scream in the distance, and it's just so good at building up the tension of just behind them, horror lurks, and outside the ring of torches is this infinite, deadly darkness that's coming for them, and not just for them, but for everyone. It's coming for the whole realm. Mm-hmm. Got through that. So a little more, um, one other, one or two other takes here. In a brief interlude, Sam boils down to where we've already seen Davos. I already brought up Davos, but this is a different look at it. And this is, this is more of a religious angle. Uh, so Davos is on the edge at one point, and he starts thinking even more than he usually does about, uh, about his faith. Sam turns to the mother here, but then quickly ditches the seven in favor of the old gods, probably because, well, he forgot that he had, you know, taken the old gods when he was joining the Night's Watch, and he's, you know, falling back on old habits. But he's remembering also that, that that's who has power here. If any gods are can help around here beyond the wall it surely isn't the seven they might not be much of help at all in general but certainly not up here beyond the wall so that's really big deal you wonder who else we only get his point of view but you got to believe that all kinds of other brothers <laughs> are thinking the same thing they're praying to the mother and the warrior and all that in their in their mind as they're being overwhelmed the ending sentence of this beautiful chapter sums up what these two surviving friends have been through. Gren says, look there, through the trees, pink light, dawn, Sam, dawn. That must be east. If we head that way, we should catch Mormont. If you say, Sam kicked his left foot against a tree to knock off the snow, then the right, I'll try. Grimacing, he took a step. I'll try hard. And then another. So it really kind of ends the way it starts. He's just taking another step, 
trying. He's got more motivation than he had before. He's a changed man now because of what he just experienced. And he's not sobbing anymore. Now he's got more determination. Um, what this says to Joe is that even with the most horrific night suffered by anyone in centuries, hope comes at the end. There is a dawn. There is a dream of spring. But only if you keep going. This man is not hailed as a hero nearly as much as he should be. Sam, that is, continuing to take difficult step after difficult step again and again, no matter how hard it is, because that's the only way to get to that far off dawn. Yep, journey of a thousand steps, y'all. Sam is doing it. Uh, Liat Rubenfeld, she points out that one the one more step thing is repeated in several chapters. Sansa, John, Cat, yes, very good catch. I did look for that. And there's, it wasn't like a strong pattern with any one single other character, but you're right that it pops up fairly often with some of these others. I think it comes up with Danny as well a bit, maybe not using the exact same language, but she definitely thinks about continuing to keep going. Uh, maybe even, maybe when she's lost beyond uh, in the Dothraki Sea in A Dance with Dragons, that might be a good time for it. So Roland Stark says, what is your take on why the others decided to attack the fist on that time? I suppose I answered that during, but to repeat, I think our best bet at this point, our best guess that, that the evidence seems to present to us is the uh, is that they wanted the horn. They wanted the, the horn of Jorm and the broken horn that Sam has. Violent Messiah says 666 is objection. No real evidence. Valyrian Steel works on others. The show isn't canon. That's very true. I mean... I think it's a safe assumption, though, because it's forged in fire, and we do hear that "quote unquote" dragon steel is effective against the others. And I feel like dragon steel might be, if if not the same as Valyrian steel, a similar sort of process, a similar ingredients. So it's very fair to keep track of the point that to this point we have not seen Valyrian steel strike an other, come in contact with an other's sword, which I'm very curious about that, or do, or even a, a white. Or have we seen it hit a white yet? No, I guess not. So, uh, but I think it's a reasonably safe guess that it will. But, yep, good to point out that it's not for sure yet. Robert Socal from Patreon. Another bit of Others lore. Speaking of the swords, open fire made the Others swords scream. Grand member Gren wields, swings his torch at the Other, and the Other slices the tip of the torch off. And it creates this crazy screaming sound that makes me think of Dragonbinder, the Dragonbinder horn that just drives everyone kind of crazy with its sound. Uh, something kind of unearthly and, and just so unpleasant and kind of... The bagpipes? <laughs> Aziz singing? <laughs> Either, yeah. I mean, it's the same category, yeah. No, Aziz I'll... has a lovely voice. It's bagpipes, sure. <laughs> bagpipes, yeah. And, and Robert Socal also brings up a similar question to what Joe raised, which is talking about how people plead to their gods. And he takes us in a little bit of a different direction. How do you pray to uh, a religion or to a deity that isn't personified and how that is something that humanity taps to lean into? He says the seven do not exist, but their advantage is in real psychological support that the believers can get from praying. Probably that is one of the reasons there are much more followers of the seven and the old gods because of this personification. That really helps. I think that's true in the real world. It's certainly true that people personify. I mean, there's, there's Jesus portraits everywhere. Obviously, you can't do that in Islam. It's, it's against the, the rules to, to, to show images of Muhammad. But still, the idea of a Muhammad, it matters. It's still, he's still a person that you can personify and and attribute deeds and appearance to, whereas the old gods of the seven, or the old gods of the north, there's no being. There's nothing you can imagine other than you can picture a werewood tree, but even that isn't the whole picture. That's more like, a werewood tree is more like a church than a god, even though like, god is in this church. Well, god is in that tree. In a sense, it's kind of a similar concept. But... <clears throat> I mean, that's what people say about, about Christianity. They'll be like, yeah. God is in that tree. That's what I mean, yeah. I that's, mean, they, it, they're not just about church, you know, obviously. Yeah. Or God is in this Chili's tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Office reference for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's a really interesting need because there's other ones like Taoism. He brings up Tao Taoism here, which is doesn't have a personified character, but, you know, 
contrast to, say, Buddhism, which has a very, very visible, very notable figure who people love to just have images of the Buddha around, um, sometimes just as decoration, sometimes for more devout reasons and everything in between. Anyway, John Hagee points out that there's similar language to Sam just moving forward and closing his eyes and, and dealing with his fear, kind of the way Catelyn deals with being on the mule in the veil. That's a good catch. I like that. I didn't think of that. Stephanie the Peerless points out that, yes, it's important to know to keep track of Gren here in this scene and Gren's witnessing of Sam the slaying. That's a huge difference from the show because it's Gilly who witnesses Sam kill the other in the show. And that's, she's just not as reliable of a witness uh, to the other Night's Watch brothers. Of course, like, well, they're going to say, oh, that's your woman now. Of course, she's going to back you up on this. She's also going to be longer lasting. Yeah. So, you know, in the show, she maybe could have spoken to it more and have been more impressed, whereas maybe more people will forget with Sam. That's a good point. And you wonder about Gren, too, because Gren dies at the Battle of the Wall in the show, but does not in the books. So he's going to also have, Gren's also going to have a longer arc. So you wonder maybe his, as an advocate for Sam, that may matter, you know? Yes. Sam advocacy is very important in this house. <laughs> and Scott Wartman points out that Ed Tollett still dropping jokes, even with an other <laughs> coming around. Lots of people just so happy like Archmaester Rennie and lots of our Flick commenters and Facebook commenters that you can't have a better debut than slaying an other. Like, Sam is the man. More lore from the Tarly house. Nina filled us in on some, but here's even more from our friend Dom Tartaglia. He says, my favorite little bit of Tarly lore is that Sam is the Tarly that lives up to the Tarly name in the most roundabout way possible. Randall, bad dad Tarly, the only human to defeat Bobby B in the field, disowns Sam for not living up to the Tarly name. Feasibly, Randall heard his house words in his head, first in battle. And yes, that is from a so spake Martin, first in battle. And thought, Sam will never be first in anything. Then, in his storm of swords, Sam becomes first by getting the living on the scoreboard in the war against winter, becoming the first human in thousands of years to kill another. So, first in battle, he's got a claim there. So many people are subtly proved wrong in so many little ways in this series, but Randall assuming Sam won't be first in battle is one of the very best little ironies George pulled off. Well said, Dom. I totally agree with that. Good, good catch. Certainly, uh, even the show brings up <laughs> Sam beyond the wall, but uh, that's going to go so differently, I'm quite sure. And our last comment from Tracy McMillan, a.k.a. Lady R. Ardross. This quote, it slid away from Paul's axe, armor rippling in its crystal sword, twisted and spun and slipped between the iron rings of Paul's mail, through leather and wool and bone and flesh. It came out his back with a hiss, and Sam heard Paul say, oh, as he lost the axe. She draws our attention to how this is the ice version of Quentin's fire, oh, at the end of his chapter when he realizes he's on fire. That's pretty cool. Nice catch there. Um, definitely a fire O and an ice O. Good way to end. Thank you all, everybody, so much for attending live or sending questions ahead of time or for liking and sharing afterwards. We very much appreciate it. Last week, we covered 172 minutes and 38 seconds of audiobook. This week, 168 minutes and 44 seconds. Pretty similar. I'm not unmuted, and our episode is about two and a half hours long. All right, right on. <laughs> uh, so you can check the video links to see how much we edited out if you're listening to the podcast version. As Ashea said, it's about two and a half hours long. Next time on, only four chapters next week, so figures to be a little shorter, but you know we had to arrange things to make things line up nicely. We're starting off with a big one, Tyrion 3. The gang gets ordered around by Tywin, a.k.a. the one where Tyrion and Sansa are betrothed. Catelyn 3, the one with the dead prisoners, a.k.a. Karstark loses his head. Jamie 3, everybody wants Jamie, a.k.a. the Kingslayer's last hand. And Arya 4, the one with the ghost of High Heart, a.k.a. the gang tours the Riverlands. Yeah, ghost of High Heart next week, huh? That's a good one. All right, so Ashea is the best, as you well know, but we can't say enough. Thank you to her for doing so much behind the scenes and contributing some thoughts directly to the topics as well. One of many things she does. 
Thanks to but Joe. But mostly Bu- humor. <laughs> Thanks as uh, to Joe Buckley and Nina Friel for their contributions directly to the document and to all of our thoughts. I highly recommend checking out Joe's podcast Isle of Faces and Nina's blog Good Queen Alley on Tumblr. That's one L like Alisan. Thanks to our History of Westeros mods for posting the chapters with wonderful art every week and leading the discussions in our Facebook group, which is our large, largest and most, uh, well, largest, that's all I need to say. It's the biggest of our social media outlets. There's about 2,800 people in the group. But also check out the conversations on Flick, Slack, or Discord, or Patreon, and join whatever uh, ones of those lines up best with your needs and interests. Thanks to Michael, Clare, uh, Michael Clarfeld for the maps and helping us hook up with Kevin McLeod, who is responsible for the Valar Reredis intro music. Thanks also to Joey Townsend and Jesse Kowal for our regular History of Westeros music. Thanks to our Benjineer for the editing and audio assistance. And last but not least, certainly thank you to all of the patrons who keep our lights on, keep us employed in doing this. That we can bring you an episode every week, and more than that, we bring more than an episode per week. But Valar Reredis every Sunday is a wonderful, great pattern, great uh, thing. I love to do. I love being here every Sunday talking to you guys about this. It's it's one of the best parts of my week. I look forward to next week. Until then, you certainly know what to do. Valar Reredis.